السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, we'll start our third and last day from our symposium. Uh, I want to welcome everyone, our attendees, our uh, respected speakers from everywhere. Uh, today, our first lecture will be from USA, from Professor Anubama Rafi. Uh, professor Van Pamarov is as Assistant Professor of Pediatric, Medical Director of Outpatient Children's Center, My Clinic, Rochester. Uh, Dr. Rafi will uh, speak to us about approach to atopic child. Welcome, uh, Dr. Rafi, and we are happy to be with us. Thank you very much for being with us. You can start, you can share your slides. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to speak today. Um, I'll be speaking about uh, pediatric food allergies. I have no financial disclosures. So the objectives of this talk will be to really understand and recognize the clinical symptoms of a food allergic reaction, understand the management of anaphylaxis, understand when and how to introduce peanuts, and briefly talk about peanut oral immunotherapy. What is the heart of an allergic reaction? When we think about an allergic reaction, it always comes back to this particular immune cell. This immune cell is known as the mast cell. And as you can see within this immune cell, there are um, granules as indicated in blue. And within these granules, one of the mediators is known as histamine. So when you have cross-linking of the receptors and activation of this immune cell, you'll have release of histamine. And it's that histamine that will then cause symptoms, allergic symptoms. Some of those allergic symptoms you may see most commonly will be urticaria or hives, angioedema, so skin manifestations. You can also see shortness of breath as well as abdominal pain as associated with some of these other symptoms. What are the most common causes of anaphylaxis in children? The number one cause is food allergies. And this then is followed by stinging insect allergies, medication allergies. So this is our first case. Our first case is a six month old female with severe atopic dermatitis and asthma presenting with perioral hives following scrambled egg consumption. This child has never consumed peanut butter in her lifetime and mother really wants to introduce peanuts. What are, what are your recommendations and do you think that she needs an EpiPen? So um, I don't know if uh, people wanna write answers in the chat or uh, let people know what their thoughts are. Um, but these were, are the potential options. So avoid all the nuts, put a small amount of peanut butter on her skin and assess the response. Give her a small amount of peanut butter and see what happens. Wait until closer to one year of age and then give her a small amount of peanut butter. Proceed with blood and skin testing to the top eight allergens. So I don't know if uh, people want to just put some answers in the chat and we can see what people's uh, ideas or thoughts may be. Okay, well, I'll move on. Um, so the top eight allergenic foods, peanut is considered to be the most common overall as followed by uh, tree nuts and egg. Milk, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish are also 
um, highly allergenic. And it's really the protein structure that makes um, a certain food more allergenic. So when you think of peanut, the bonds within the peanut protein are very strong. And so that it even with um, salivary um, processing, digestive processing, those uh, proteins tend to stay very intact. So this is the reason why these tend to be the most allergenic. And then the ninth one um, is sesame seed. This was a study done at Mayo Clinic um, looking um, at the top allergens. As you can see in the uh, less than one year of age population that uh, milk, egg, and peanut were the most common. There's also age-related differences in the way you might see anaphylaxis. So in this study, um, there were children um, and 52% met the criteria for anaphylaxis. And when they looked in their study, they really noted that the largest proportion of anaphylaxis occurred in children less than two years of age. And they looked at symptoms based on age. So when we think about infants, the most common presenting symptoms you will see is hives and vomiting. And for preschool age children aged around two to five years of age, you're going to see wheezing, strider, and then in adolescents, you're going to notice difficulty breathing, trouble swallowing. And in this study, there was 3% uh, of children that had documented hypotension. And they noted that in these, the children that were the most likely to get anaphylaxis really did not have their blood pressure um, drawn. So only 60% did. And as the uh, child was older, they were more likely to obtain a blood pressure measurement. So this just highlights the importance that if you're thinking an allergic type of reaction to really do obtain that uh, blood pressure. And then um, they also noted that at the time of discharge, how many patients do they actually get diagnosed or labeled anaphylaxis? And it's a very small percentage, 14% um, in children and then 6% in the infant. So it's really important to recognize anaphylaxis, obtain blood pressure measurements, um, and really educate the family that it was anaphylaxis. So how do we go about making that food allergy diagnosis? Um, looking at the clinical symptoms, so hives, lip tongue swelling, shortness of breath, vomiting, abdominal pain associated with these other symptoms. And then you're going to have confirmatory positive testing to the allergenic food. It's important to note that both um, these criteria do need to be met. There are some children that might have false positive testing. Allergy uh, tests are notorious to have false positives. So that clinical history of consumption and having a reaction is very important. There might be another clinical scenario where um, you might be able to diagnose food allergy, and that would be in a child with severe eczema, and then you know that, wow, their, te their peanut testing is markedly elevated, and in that scenario, you can diagnose peanut allergy. Let's talk a little bit more about what these tests mean. So we have um, IgE tests, and those are things that you can obtain via the blood. We also have skin prick testing. Um, and on the x-axis here, you have the numerical value. And so if, some, if there's a child that I see that has an IgE of peanut to 17.5, and I don't know anything about their clinical history, I can already predict that that child has some sort of reaction to peanut. So once again, the level indicates the probability of having some sort of reaction. It doesn't necessarily denote severity of the reaction. So a child with a level of 3.5 to peanut might have just hives or could have anaphylaxis. It's really more what happens on consumption that determines severity. And peanut uh, reactions in general tend to be very severe. So in regards to what uh, the guidelines have said over the several past years on what to do with introduction, um, around 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics advised 
uh, to really introduce closer to three years of age. Then in 2008, they really noted there's no convincing evidence. And um, in this study that was published in 2008, they really noted that early consumption of peanut in infancy is really associated with that low prevalence of peanut allergy. So when they looked at uh, Jewish children in the UK versus Israel, there was a tenfold higher peanut allergy prevalence in the UK compared to Israel. And this was really thought to the amount of uh, consumption of peanut that was occurring. So in Israel, they were consuming it about eight times a month and in the UK zero. This, this then led to the 2015 LEAP study, which is the, um, the first randomized trial to show that there was really a benefit to early peanut introduction. The study design, they really uh, all patients want an oral food challenge, which is the gold standard to confirm the lack of a peanut allergy. So there were 640 children that were aged four to 11 months of age, and they had to have severe eczema and or egg allergy. And they were divided into the skin prick positive and skin prick negative cohort. And then half those patients were just, uh, designated either to the peanut avoidance or peanut consumption group. So the results were quite remarkable. Um, ultimately, their primary outcome was to see the number of patients um, that underwent a food challenge at five years of age um, for five grams of peanut protein. And so for the skin prick negative cohort of patients, there was an 86.1 relative risk reduction. And for that positive skin prick testing cohort, it was 70%. And so it's really based on this that we really, um, the guidelines went on to say the addendum guidelines that if there is some risk of severe egg allergy or both to really do that testing and see if the immune system has already determined or designated the child to be peanut allergic or not. And if smaller than to maybe do a challenge. And so this was the algorithm that was recommended at that time. And with that recommendation, they had advised two teaspoons of peanut butter um, or two grams of peanut uh, butter, um, multiple different options of giving um, formulations to give the child. Um, and of course, the first time you're giving any sort of allergenic food or a peanut, you really want to do it when the child is feeling healthy, do it at home, really have one adult that's being able to be there and monitor the child for one to two hours after. And I always say the purest form is better. And um, some instructions for um, the child for preparation. Of course, you don't ever wanna give whole nuts uh, to children um, nor peanut butter because it can be a choking hazard. Um, this is still true to date that once you do introduce an allergenic food or peanut butter into the child's diet, you really want to have that child consume it regularly to maintain tolerance or prevent development of peanut allergy. This is the most up-to-date guidelines that um, were just recently published in 2021. And eczema is noted to be the highest risk factor for developing food allergies. But it's important to note that children without eczema can still develop food allergies. To help prevent peanut and or egg allergy, you really want to aim that the uh, that these allergens uh, be introduced around six months of life. The earliest might be at four. So four to six months is usually what allergists call as the, uh, the window of when allergenic foods uh, should be introduced. When we think about tests, a lot of par parents here in the United States um, really request testing. There's a lot of fear of introducing allergenic foods, particularly if it's their first child. So it's not required, but if sometimes a family is really nervous and just wants to do that testing for reassurance, um, I will do the testing. 
I do counsel families that there might be false positive tests. And if that becomes the case, we might then have to do an oral food challenge where they come to the allergy lab, we give them a small amount and then assess their clinical response to determine, is it a food allergy or are they okay with that food? Um, other allergens um, such as wheat, um, milk, um, sesame seed, all those allergenic foods um, should be introduced around that time. So you do not need to wait till one, two, three years of age. Um, and then it's really important for children to have a diverse diet. There are studies uh, to show that um, diversity of food allergen um, can help prevent um, atopic disorders and food allergies. So going back to the case, I would say that uh, in this scenario that the older guidelines would have said, you know, you should test for peanut. The newest guidelines would say that you can give her a small amount of peanut butter and assess the clinical response. If you wanted to do testing, that would be okay, but um, this would be the most preferred um, in the way we counsel families. So with that, to patients or to carry a following straight egg consumption, I would advise to do some form of confirmatory testing. So you can either um, do the skin prick testing, um, if you, you're an allergist, of course, or we have that blood testim, testing or serum specific IgE. The other thing to note is uh, for egg, there are some children that have um, egg allergy that they are able to tolerate in the baked egg form. So such as a muffin cake bread that's 350 degrees for at least 25 minutes. And um, we might do that oral challenge to that baked egg depending on the age of the child. Usually I'll wait till somewhere about 15 to 18 months of age to consider that. So this is our second case. We have a five month old with severe atopic dermatitis. Father asked, can we please perform a food testing panel? Because I really want to know if there is some sort of food that's the underlying root cause for the child's eczema, particularly wheat products. What additional questions should you ask? What testing would you perform? And what are your recommendations? So what symptoms do the wheat products cause? Um, it's really important to distinguish when the child eats wheat, is it hives, like the itchy raised welts that look like those, of course, welts uh, urticaria, or is it more a flat rash like an atopic dermatitis flare? It's also very important to stress that eczema is not caused by foods. In, within the United States here, this is a very common uh, misconception, even by primary care providers, that they wanna figure out what is the food that's causing the eczema. Eczema is not caused by foods. The underlying mechanism um, I tell families is it's just the skin immune system being revved up and certainly environmental allergens as well as uh, foods might be a worsening factor. But even if you took foods out, it wouldn't resolve the atopic dermatitis. And even in those cases where wheat may be an exacerbating factor, I still advise consumption. The, re the rationale is that continued consumption really helps to uh, prevent that development of a food allergy. There are some scenarios that patients come to see me at the first time when there may be five after seeing several allergists or individuals. Um, and with positive testing, they take foods out. It's really important that panel testing not be performed. So our moving on to our next case, this is a, uh, a four month old with severe atopic dermatitis. Mother notes that primary care provider had obtained some labs um, and found severe, uh, found it to be positive. And so this is not what I had hoped to do, but I am found, find myself in this scenario. So IgE to wheat was negative, IgE to egg white was 17, IgE to peanut was 3.5. What would you counsel the family and the primary care provider? So avoid wheat, eggs, and peanut, um, a lot of different things that you could advise. 
So I want to um, go back to these curves. These, this I showed you for peanut. We also have these curves available for other allergens. And as you can see, a 3.5 for one food allergen might be different for each one. So if you look at the probability of having some sort of reaction to cow's milk versus egg white, they're different. So you really have to look at the number in context with that particular food allergen. And once again, it tells you the probability of reacting to a food. It doesn't tell you the severity of the reaction. And so for this uh, patient, I would say since the wheat is negative, go ahead and introduce wheat into the diet. The child has never consumed this food. And then IgE to egg white of 17 is quite high. That basically already denotes that that child will have some sort of reaction to egg white. And the peanut was elevated uh, um, significantly and would advise to avoid as well. So in Western countries, peanut allergy prevalence is up to 3%. It's important to note that peanuts are different from tree nuts. Uh, tree nuts are the nuts that grow on trees, whereas peanut is part of the legume family. There are some children that are allergic to both, and there are some children that might be allergic to one and not the other. The mainstay ther therapy for peanut allergy is um, making sure you carry epinephrine. So any food allergy, I always recommend carrying epinephrine. And I also um, might counsel the family that outside of the home avoid all nuts, but if a child is able to tolerate tree nuts, um, that they could consume it within the home, as long as it's not cross-contaminated with other foods. Um, it's important to note that peanuts is in a lot of foods, it can be hidden in foods, and it's important to avoid foods that are cross-contaminated as well. There are some predictors of which children are more likely to outgrow their peanut allergy. So the children um, that have peanut allergies, about 80% have it lifelong and 20% outgrow. The 20% outgrow usually do so by five years of age. And those are the children that have these downtrending levels. So if I see an eight-year-old and their level is like 20, I know already that child is unlikely to outgrow their, their peanut allergy. So dosing for epinephrine is there, and it's always, always uh, important to empower parents, empower children that it is a very safe medicine. If there's any um, hesitation, it's always safer to give it than not. There, in the United States, there's multiple different formulations of epinephrine. They're all great. They all have the same medicine. So usually I go with the one that the insurance company covers. Anaphylaxis plans are really helpful for families to just help guide them. So this, for every patient that we see that has a food allergy, we provide an anaphylaxis plan. Um, so in summary, um, food allergies, we have the top eight food allergens, peanut, tree nuts, egg, milk, soy, wheat, fish, and shellfish. It's really important to remember that antihistamines such as Benadryl, Zyrtec, they're not the treatment for anaphylaxis. I don't even recommend it to families because there has been shown to be a delay in administration of epinephrine when people do give antihistamines. So I tell families, okay, if you're concerned that your child's having an allergic reaction and there's two system involvement, administer the epinephrine. If it's just one or two hives, you can monitor closely without giving any medicines. Important to note that eczema is not caused by food allergies just um, full panel testing um, without any clinical symptomatology is not advised. Early introduction of peanuts in infants um, with eczema helps decrease the risk of peanut allergy. It's also advised that um, children four to six months of age uh, be introduced to allergenic foods. And then to briefly touch upon there, there is a new FDA approved therapy within the United States that is known as peanut oral immunotherapy. And this is more maybe a discussion that allergists have with their patients, 
but this is FDA approved starting at four years of age. And what it is, it's a small amount of peanut protein in a, a, a powder form that's given within the allergy lab. And then they come back um, and get slight increases in that peanut dosage, and then they continue it at home. And this is really um, a new profound therapy for many of our patients because then they may, um, if they have an accidental ingestion, the severity of that reaction is markedly decreased. So that's so there is hope uh, for patients that have peanut allergies, and they are working on um, therapies similar for other foods. Um, with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their um, their attention. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'm certainly happy to take any questions if time allows. Uh, thank you so much for your informative presentation. Uh, I just have uh, one question from our side here. Uh, we have two newborns uh, with suspected cow milk allergy. Uh, one of them, the IgE was uh, zero. Second, the IgE is high. Both presentation was only pulmonary hemorrhage in both. Can pulmonary hemorrhage be the only uh, symptom for cow milk allergy, even for in, in the neonatal period? And how so, to, if, if, if I suspect cow milk allergy, should I go only for a specific IgE or what? Um, so both of them had pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, they both Yes. So and that's very interesting. And, and, and uh, we suspected, uh, and we searched for any cause of pulmonary hemorrhage. We did not found. So then we suspected cow milk allergy. We make a challenge test. We stopped it. Then it's improved dramatically. Then again, after reintroducing, started again. And then we took it as allergy and uh, changed it to amino acid based formula. And the baby was dramatically improved. And we have currently one of them, but this one, the one we have now, has combined immune deficiency also. And he has he was presented by repeated pulmonary hemorrhage after changing to amino acid based formula. The pulmonary hemorrhage stopped. That's a very interesting report. That's, I would say, more a case report. Uh, very interesting. Um, that is certainly not the common presentation of IgE mediated cow's allergy. Uh, milk proteins. Very interesting. Um, there is another condition where we call it cow's milk um, protein allergy, where there is maternal consumption of milk in her diet and breastfeeding the baby, that then you get uh, uh, bloody stools. Uh, but this would not be a common uh, presentation. And, and I think when I think about it mechanistically, I don't, that's very interesting. I don't think I can uh, think of a mechanism to explain the, that when it's in more, in yeah, so intestinal, baby, yeah. yeah. In the very first baby examined also uh, stool, but stool for occult blood. And occult yeah. blood stool was positive. After stopping, was negative. Okay, I, I think this is that more of that cow's milk protein allergy and does not seem to be more an IgE mediated mechanism because when we think about an IgE mediated mechanism, we're really going to think about that activation of that mast cell and that histamine release. And when you have that histamine release, you're going to see more symptoms of the angioedema, urticaria, vomiting and it's not that kind of reaction. So that's why I think that patient that has that IgE that's negative, that makes sense to me because it's not that IgE mediated mechanism. It's more of, um, it's immune regulated, but a non IgE mediated cow's milk protein reaction is what it seems like. What was the IgE level on the other patient, the second patient you mentioned? It's high. What, what was the number, if you recollect? One, above 100, but I oh, don't think. That, okay, so uh, with that in uh, baby, with milk consumption, uh, like, like cow's milk formula, was that what was given or was it maternal milk ingestion? What kind of? Uh, no, just they uh, started on artificial milk. Like a cow's milk formula. In, from far, the father is not from uh, the mother is not from our city. 
Okay. Uh, we started when we observed this, and uh, based on the last experience, we just make a challenge to stop and see, and yeah. it was dramatically improved when we stopped the milk and when we changed it to acid base uh, to amino acid based formula. Yeah. It appeared completely. Wonderful. Um, so, in terms of the IgE level to uh, milk, at what point was it obtained? Was it obtained after it was changed to amino acid, or, or what point in the process? It was before. Before. Then and then, what did not gave further investigations, and that's why I just wanted to ask you if we, if we have to go to a specific IgE or do anything. The baby still with us now. If okay. we can further investigate him. And also, if you don't have too much time now, I can make it as an e-consult and uh, send it to you if you want. Oh, I'm happy to answer it right now because I think it's such an interesting case. Um, oh. I think that the IgE to uh, uh, 100 basically says that there is at risk of having like hives, angioedema, lip tongue swelling, but it sounds like the baby did not experience that. So for the first child, I would wait until maybe one closer to one year of age. How old is the baby now? Like maybe a month, a few weeks? Five months or six months. Yeah, I would wait till one year of age and then do a re-challenge at that time in a small amount. Like you could even do like half an ounce and then assess what happens. There is no testing for that child that's going to further determine whether or not this reaction will happen. It's really going to be the challenge because that child did not have any IgE mediated kind of symptoms. And for that second child with the IgE to 100, I am nervous that that child in future reintroduction with milk in any form might get hives, lip, tongue, swung. So that's one that I would do in guidance uh, with an allergist to make sure that there's not like some sort of anaphylaxis kind of reaction, just given the level of the IgE. So I would say that maybe closer to one year of age for the second child, that you would want to do an IgE to milk and see how where that is. And if it is positive, depending on how positive it is, the allergist might say, avoid milk because it's so high, maybe consider a baked milk challenge in the allergy lab, or if it's low enough, maybe consider a straight milk challenge. So I think the second child needs more close um, management with an allergist. Okay, thank Very you. Very interesting cases. I'm really appreciative of that. I will send you as an uh, e-consultation between sure. uh, our and uh, my clinic. Okay, now I have another two questions from Dr. Sana Yahya. The first one is when to introduce eggs and wheat to a new pole. This one, the second, it is important to ask for egg allergy before giving a measles vaccine. Okay, so for the first question is introducing eggs and wheat to a newborn. And uh, what was the question like when to introduce, how to introduce? Yes, when. When. So I would do it four to six months of age. So I have two, I'm a mom of two kids and I practice what I preach, so to speak. So for my children, or so at four months of age, you can start with just like complementary foods that are non-allergenic, just to make sure like here they do like fruit puree, applesauce, things that are blended fruits and vegetables. As soon as they do well with that, then you can take just uh, some sort of wheat cereal. I would advise that it's not mixed with any other grains. Like you wouldn't want rice mixed with it. So the first thing in the morning, wheat cereal mixed with some sort of fruit puree a little bit, and then a few minutes later, a little bit. So that at four months of age is the earliest I would do it. I would highly recommend earlier. Um, for children that have had delayed introduction, I have seen wheat allergies. It's rare, but I do see it. And with the egg, egg um, the texture of it is a little bit more challenging sometimes around four months. So sometimes what I do is I will, once uh, the child's done okay with wheat, um, uh, I, I'm and okay with some sort of yogurt, I might then do like a baked muffin and make it into a puree or take a hard boiled egg and chop it up finely. But you can also do that at four months of age. But I really would want to see if you could do it by itself, you know, the egg itself, that's the easiest way. But those are some uh, different ways to go about that. Um, the second question was, 
in the setting of a child with an egg allergy, whether or not to administer childhood vaccines and influenza is a big question I get. Uh, you can administer all childhood vaccines, routine vaccines. There's no contraindication. I get a lot of questions from doctors about the influenza vaccine that is very safe to give. I've had patients that you have egg um, anaphylaxis even a few weeks earlier. I give the influenza vaccine. You do not even need to observe them afterwards. It's very safe to give. Okay, thank you so much for being with us and uh, we hope inshallah we'll see you again. All right, thank you so much, bye. Bye-bye. Okay. You can stop sharing. Uh, now we'll go to our second speaker. Uh, our second speaker will be Dr. Mustafa Al Said. Dr. Mustafa Al Said is a professor of dermatology in Al Mansura uh, University in Egypt, and he is the current uh, head of the department of dermatology uh, department in Saudi German Hospital Riyadh. Uh, Dr. Mustafa will speak to us about napkin dermatitis. What is behind? Welcome, Dr. Mustafa, and thank you for being with us. Welcome, uh, Dr. Nabil and the organizing committee. It is an honor to share with you. Uh, so today we are speaking about diaper dermatitis or napkin rash, what are pain? Uh, having a child, having a child fall asleep in your arm is one of the most peaceful feeling in the world. So <clears throat> we are aiming to have a sleepy child without any complaint. Diaper rash or napkin rash, the dermatitis is a general term describing any of a number of inflammatory skin condition that can occur in the diaper area. They are classified according to directly or indirectly caused by the wearing of diaper, including irritant contact dermatitis, miliaria, intertrigo, candidal diaper dermatitis, granuloma, gluteal, infantum. Second, rashes that appear elsewhere but can be exaggerated in the groin area due to the irritating effect of wearing a diaper including atopic dermatitis, break dermatitis, and psoriasis. The third rash that appear in the diaper area irrespective of the diaper use, including polus in betaigo, acrodermatitis enteropathica, Langerhans cell histocytosis, congenital syphilis, and escapes. The incidence, napkin dermatitis is a very common complaint, up to 35% of the infants. Breastfeed infants have lower incidence, the prevalence is highest in infants nine to 12 months. The pathogenesis is a tetrad, including disruption of skin barrier, irritation, microbial contamination, and inflammation. The physical irritation, including increased skin wetness, increased permeability, leading to increased penetration of irritating substances. The chemicals, including bacteria in stool, urease producing, leads to uh, uh, and formation of ammonia and ammoniacal skulls. Occlusion of the diaper increased pH, and the fecal enzyme increased direct irritation with bile salts. The microbial, including candida, which 92% of napkin dermatitis is positive culture for candida, including skin and stool. Other microbial infection include any whoop, 90%, bacteroid, peptostreptococcus, especially also staph in atopic dermatitis. Rare infection, including herpes simplex, dermatophyte, and cytomegalovirus, and host problems. There is new recently introduced role of skin microbiome as the changes of the microbiome of the skin leading to a change of the pH of the skin and impaired microbiome composition produce a local inflammation with the interaction of many mediators, including interleukin-1, interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha. This is a photo showing the 
pathogenesis of uh, of uh, atopic dermatitis with the role of uh, changing of microbiome and the role of uh, probiotic shield which help in in, in uh, keeping the barrier normal and the beneficial metabolite secretion and adjusting the pH the clinical features, the classic form of napkin dermatitis or diaper rash is allergic contact dermatitis. It often occurs during the second and third month. The skin lesion is confluent erysema of the areas in contact with the diaper. The eruption is more or less confined to the margins of the napkin area. Here is the classic picture of napkin dermatitis. Another. The acute lesion are usually glazed erysema with exfoliation. The chronic lesion may be fine scale. The erysematous type, intensely red confluent erysema of depth of the flexure falls, small pustule, satellite lesion, especially associated with candida albicans, like this. The psoriasiform type, well marginated erysematous psoriasiform plus prominent scaling. Herpetiform type, vesicles and pustule, showing shallow erosions and closely resembling herpes simplex. Granulomatous type, which is called infantile gluteal granuloma, is a rare type, which the four in the form of dome-shaped reddish crown or purple nodule. This is the scaly type. This is the psoriasiform type. Herpetiform type, herpetiform, uh, polus impetigo like. The miliaria and intertrigo. This is a secondary occur due to obstruction of the eccrine sweet glands as the stratum corneum becomes hydrated and the edematous, occluding the uh, transepidermal uh, eccrine ducts. Intertrigo with skin, which is more fragile, with a high coefficient of friction, becomes damaged from maceration to form a maceration. The candidal dermatitis, usually bright red, involves the false uh, with satellite pustule. And the important thing is resistant to candidal diaper rash in young children may be a sign of type 1 diabetes mellitus, chronic mucocutaneous candiditis, or underlying immune deficiency. Granuloma gluteal infantum rashes last month resistant to treatment and asymptomatic, like this. This is candida with uh, satellite for runner. Bacterial superinfection can occur in the form of erosion, bustule, yellowish serum crust, and occasionally poly, like this. Staph. Atopic dermatitis. In atopic dermatitis, usually there is a family or personal history of allergic rhinitis, hay fever, asthma, pruritic associated with current or previous flares of rash on the face and extensor limb surfaces. Like this, this eczematous lesion, eczema, back. The cyprinic dermatitis, it is usually occur in infant age two weeks to three months. Oily, scaly, crusted dermatitis in the scalp in the form of cradle cap, retroauricular uh, region, axillary and persistent and the presternal area. And it is rarely isolated to the diaper area. Here is the scalp, cradle cap. And there is an important note that any child with widespread supraic dermatitis, diarrhea, and failure to thrive should be evaluated for liner disease a functional defect of the C4, C3, C4 component of complement. Cipuria, cipuria like erythroderma beginning on the scalp or diaper area, uh, followed by a persistent gastrointestinal disturbance, market wasting, and weight loss and recurrent staph and candidal infection. Uh, br brief note about liner, liner's disease or erythroderma discometavum. It is a deficient functional assay of yeast opsonization along with the clinical tetrad of generalized severe superior like erythroderma, recurrent secondary staph, candida or gram negative bacterial infection, resistant to profuse malabsorptive diarrhea, failure to thrive or market wasting, plus minus biotin deficiency. Here is lane, uh, liner disease with infantile superior like erythroderma with superior in uh, the napkin area, which usually involves the crease associated with the other uh, tetrad of symptom and sign. Psoriasis, with psoriasis, there is family history of psoriasis, not responsive to barrier cream or antifungal agents. Involved area includes the scalp and nails. This is well, well circumscribed erysematous lesion 
maybe with the scales, kneel, scalp, knee, back, trunk, other areas. The second uh, most important, the acrodermatite centuropasica or zinc deficiency, it is have two types, uh, genetic or non-genetic, uh, spor sporadic, I mean, uh, maybe uh, autosomal recessive. Uh, the defect is in the zinc binding ligand in the intestine, the solute ligand C39A4 gene, code for the zinc transporter protein. A mutation in it disrupts the uptake, transport, and overall homeostasis of zinc. Uh, and in the primary, uh, this is in the primary acrodermatic centuropasica, with secondary to partial block to the, to the zinc absorption across the small intestine. And usually there is history of prematurity and usually occur after weaning from breast milk as breast milk uh, provides the deficient zinc. The clinical picture of acrodermatous is apathy, failure to thrive, dermatitis, usually pyrorificial, vesicles, erosions, erosion of hands, palmar crease, erosive paronychia, uh, diarrhea, alopecia, and maybe in the napkin area, here is the lesion. It's poorly around the mouse, around the, the napkin area uh, with ulceration and the erosion. Treatment is zinc sulfate, elementary 2 mg per kg per day up to the adult age is necessary. The, the other, uh, the other uh, disease occur in the napkin area irrespective to the wearing of the diaper is langer hansel histiocytosis. Previous called the uh, lizard, uh, Langer Hansel histocytosis in the form of red orange or yellow brown scaly papule erosions with severe hemorrhagic diaper dermatitis. Uh, the hemorrhagic nature is very characteristic for Lang, Lang Hansel histocytosis with an response to any treatment. Other involved areas, including the scalp in the form of superior dermatitis like and retroauricular area associated also with diarrhea. Here is the, in the napkin area, histocytosis napkin area, uh, red uh, papule, erosion, hemorrhagic, uh, involving the flexures. Another photo is the scalp, like superior dermatitis like. It's previously called literary uh, CV disease. Now it's called the skin only langer Hansel histocytosis in the new classification. Here is the scalp also, cyclic dermatitis life. Again, the congenital syphilis is also can occur in the napkin area in the form of reddish brown, copper uh, red scaly macules and papules, perianal papular lesion, condyloma lata, on the palms, soles, around the mouth, bolus or erosive lesion in the napkin area, flexural condylomata, rhinitis. It has splenomegaly, low pulse weight, irregular features. The investigation is using VDRL, TBI, are positive, and FTA uh, antibodies, uh, specific IgM is confirmatory. This is the case of scaly uh, lesion in a syphilitic child in the napkin area. Scabies also can occur in the napkin area. Uh, including of papule, exocreated papule, vesicles, parus, nodules, and execrations are found. Uh, specifically in new, new nate, the palm soles are involved, may also face scalp and genitalia. Here is the lesion. It specifically occur in the palms and axillae in the form of papule or papillo vesicles. Uh, don't forget the child abuse because the child abuse is a consideration in severe recalcitrant or atypical diaper dermatitis um, appear as resistant to treatment may actually be the result either by neglection or uh, abuse by parent or caregiver. The diaper area also is a possible site for scalds, burns, and bruises in abused child. What are the factors that support or exclude non-diaper associated dermatitis? This is the most important is associated uh, symptoms like diarrhea, systemic symptoms. Uh, information about the diapering should be, uh, should be recovered from the parents or caregiver, including the type, how often, methods of laundering, cloth diaper, if cloth diaper is used. Information about how the diaper area is cleansed. Exposure to contagious disease either in the family or the neighbors, like scapes, herpes simplex virus, 
past history of dermatologic allergic or infectious illness, family history, psoriasis, atopy, antib and antibiotic use, which predisposes to microbiome change uh, leading to uh, candidal dermatitis and diarrhea. What, how to prevent and treat the, hel the healthiest skin is the non occluded skin. And breast milk is a preventive factor. As the incidence in breastfeed uh, newness, uh, the napkin dermatitis is low in breastfeed uh, milk babies. Keep skin and clean and dry. Frequent diaper changes up to eight, more than eight a day. Uh, however, the studies about uh, which the best choice for diaper for using infants is the controversial issue. It's non conclusive. However, the main recommendation is using disposable absorbent, super absorbent with gelling materials. Uh, there is barrier creams, including which block irritants and emulsions the skin, like petrolatum, zinc oxide, sacral fat, which is originally used for gastric uh, protection. There is a new uh, formula like paste-like or uh, cream. It's actually from India, this photo from Indian market. Uh, topical steroid, only hydrocortisone, 1% cream for a short period is advisable. However, mometazone claims that it has the same safety like hydrocortisone, 1%. Antimicrobial agents has a role, especially as we, we said before, that candida contaminate 90% of cases using anti-candidal like nistatin, clotrimazole, micro, micro, myconazole, and systemic antibiotic if evidence secondary bacterial infection is there. The role of probiotic treatment up till now has, as we said in the pathogenesis, the microbiome uh, this, uh, dysbiosis is important. Uh, however, the trial is very limited. One trial they add, they found decreased the incidence and improve uh, of uh, the children using the probiotic uh, containing uh, different types of uh, probiotic uh, bacteria. Uh, however, the consumer feedback was the consumer, uh, although the consumer feedback was very positive, this type of research it presents substantial methodological lim limitation, and there is little opportunity to monitor confounding factors and possible bias incentives. Furthermore, vigorous scientific research on use of probiotic is uh, still uh, worthful and desired. Uh, take home message again, finally, we said again, the healthiest skin is the non occluded skin. The second, if any diaper dermatitis that does not resolve readily with the standard treatment must be further evaluated for underlying diseases. And finally, it's a P A, P, C, D rules for napkin dermatitis care. A means air out the skin by allowing the child to go diaper free for as long as possible the parents or caregiver can. B, for barrier use, a paste or ointment to protect the skin. C, clean, keep the skin clean. D, using disposable diaper. E, educate caregivers about prevention of diaper rash. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mustafa, for your uh, excellent presentation. I just have a question. Uh, what your advice for the pediatrician to start with uh, if, a patient, if a baby with napkin dermatitis went to them, and when they should refer this baby to a dermatologist? Uh, first, uh, as we said, take care of the napkin uh, itself, frequent change up to more than eight per day. Second thing is uh, moisturizing or barrier cream. If there is inflammation, we can use uh, either anti-candidal, with very mild uh, topical steroid, uh, like hydrocortisone, 1% only. After yeah, a maximum three to five days, if not improved, should be referred for, uh, for uh, derma for shaking other uh, possible causes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, another question from Dr. Hala Youssef. Uh, how about using of Mibo cream? Yeah, if there is erosion, if there is erosion, and we exclude superimposed bacterial infection, uh, we can use uh, mepo cream uh, liberally. And li like sacral fate cream, but unfortunately sacral fate cream is uh, only for, for my knowledge is only available in India. 
I cannot find it in the Saudi market or even Egyptian market. Uh, thank you so much, Mustafa, for being with us. We're Sorry. honored to have you with us. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, and you. So our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Mohammed Hani uh, Timsah. Dr. Mohammed Hani Timsah is a professor of pediatrics in King Saud University Medical City. He is a member of child protection team in KSA. Uh, we'll just wait for him. He just uh, have a problem and he will join soon. I will try to contact him again. Uh, Dr. Mazar, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready if you are. Yes, if you will, because he still has a problem, so you can go with, uh, with you, and then we, we will wait for him. Okay, so we'll take the next speaker, will be Professor Dr. Mazar Ashur. Uh, Professor Dr. Mazar Ashur is a professor of pediatrics in uh, Cairo University. Uh, he was the head of the gastroenterology unit in Abovish Hospital. Uh, Dr. Mazar is one of the eminent uh, intensivists in Egypt, and he is an ex-consultant uh, of Saudi German Hospital Group. Oh, by the way, he was my first uh, teacher and first consultant in Saudi Arabia here when I started. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazar, for being with us, and you can start sharing your uh, presentation. Dr. Mazar will start, uh, will give us two lectures. The first one uh, will be about diarrheal disease is a still health hazard in Egypt. The second one will be an approach to critically ill children with fluid and electrolyte uh, detergent. Thank you, Dr. Mazar, and you can start. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction. I'm really very thrilled. To be with you for the fifth time, I think, or the fourth time. Uh, full screen, Dr. Mazza. Excuse me? Full screen. Okay. It is sharing? Yes, now is okay. Okay. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, talking about how much I love to be, uh, I like to be, to join this meeting. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in the coming half an hour, we will try to talk about how is diarrheal disease is still health hazard. Maybe some people will think this is an old subject. No, but we still have a big problem in our community, especially in Egypt. I will try to explore the magnitude of the problem and the consequences of it. Also, we, we can have a better understanding of this issue. Uh, 
in, in our talk, we, we, we will talk about how is diarrhea still to be important cause of morbidity and mortality all the worldwide, actually not in Egypt only. I know that there is a big progress which happened in the last, you can say century or last 20 years, where people have improved much with the tech new technology and especially in early 80s with the production of the ORS or oral uh, rehydration solution and the program of the WHO to improve this. Actually, if we go to the statistic, we found that by 1980, the, uh, the mortality rate, which was related to diarrhea, was reaching up to 4.6 million mortality for children under five years. In 1999, this has improved much with the mortality has come down to half with 2.2 on the million deaths. This is a big number, of course, I know, but still, this means that we have to do a lot of effort to improve this. We need more effort. By our uh, era in this decade, actually it has uh, much decrement. It, it reached around three quarter of a million deaths. It's, it's still a high number, something about it. Uh, the Egyptian National Control Diarrheal Disease Program, the uh, the, the, the burden of the disease considering the mortality and morbidity of such patient. Uh, they succeed or not. Uh, actually, uh, there is an argument about this because some people say with the still diarrhea having is a, one of the leading causes of this in Egypt. And this is the latest statistic in 2017. The morbidity of diarrhea actually did not show that much decline in comparison to mortality. And uh, still children get two or three attacks per year, those for those under five years, according to WHO. In, in this millennium, we are aiming to get rid of this uh, disease, actually. This is caused with, with this big mortality and, and morbidity we are seeing these days. I think this can happen uh, with more technology and more association between uh, yeah, the society and the medical field. Why we are staying, why we discuss the area? Because it's still the area is an important public health. Actually, uh, diarrheal disease remain to be a second cause of, our, of the leading causes of this in children under five years. As we say, three quarter children died under uh, uh, every year. They are under five years old. Study as well in Egypt have shown that the Egyptian say that diarrheal disease is, uh, is under five years is a complex sub uh, subject. I mean, is an interaction between the socioeconomic environment and different behavior. In developed country, still the morbidity is high for diarrheal disease, and it is a common cause for admission in the uh, hospital. In, the, in this study or this talk, I'm, I'm, I will take two items only to discuss here, with, which is that heterogeneous etiology that comes with diarrheal disease, especially with viral infection, and the possible severe outcome or morbidity and complications that come with diarrheal disease. The, so the scope of our study would be on the emerging new agent and the complication associated with diarrheal disease. Let me remind you of some definition of diarrhea. Refer to abnormal loose stool. This is then the normal for the individuals. This is different according to the age and to the habits, I mean eating habits. It, it is different from one to one. Another practical definition comes with that if you pass only one water stool, which is explosive, or have three loose stool in 24 hours, this is considered to be diarrhea. Diarrhea has become another name for the gastroenteritis, actually. We now, we, we, we don't call it gastroenteritis, we call it diarrhea, because uh, diarrhea usually uh, is an, uh, is an entity of the gastroenteritis is usually present with gastroenteritis. If we declassify the area, we can classify it into acute and chronic. Here we are considering with the acute diarrhea, which is usually is related to infectious diarrhea. 
actually this is uh, usually this infectious diarrhea has a rabbit who owns it and is commonly self-limiting. It might last for five to seven, year, uh, seven days without complication can go very safely. Talking about the chronic diarrhea is a very big entity and uh, this is not our scope here. How's diarrhea is happening? The basis of all form of diarrhea is the disturbed intestinal so, so, solute transport. Here I mean that uh, along the across uh, the intestinal membrane, the passage of water and electrolyte. Electrolyte, which is mean or what the solute is sodium, chloride and glucose. And this is, can cause disturbance in all the electrolyte and the fluid in the body. The mechanism which happened for this diarrhea, oh, we all know this, these four items, the uh, either activation of the cyclic MB or osmotic or uh, this uh, short pouch syndrome, for example, decrease absorbed surface, which was uh, yeah, discussed very uh, enough by Dr. Samira. Motility disorder, I wish I could have the chance to discuss this next time, inshallah. The challenge of diarrhea, as we all know, could be non-infectious or infectious, and non-infectious is usually related to chronic diarrhea. It can be present as acute, but usually it, it takes another course of what we are talking about. Infectious diarrhea is an inflammatory or not inflammatory. Usually the inflammatory is related to bacterial invasion or the production of cytokines. The non-inflammatory, this is, comes with various destruction. This can happen by virus or parasite. Infectious diarrhea, the causes for it is either bacteria, parasite, fungi, or virus. I have gone through a rapid review of diarrhea. And uh, this is the burden caused by, by, by diarrhea mortality. Unfortunately, I can find that Egypt is taking a big entity or, or a big chair in the, in the mortality of diarrhea. I will start with talking about the emerging of new agent. Uh, to me, I think this is, uh, could be new. Actually, this is things started in the last decade. The inter uh, in the last decade, we most of us that have uh, been faced with cases of uh, respiratory infection, simply usually we say it's viral infection, but usually most of these patients will have diarrhea. Uh, the emergence of uh, investigation have shown that there's uh, uh, another emerging organism responsible for this, which is a paracovirus. This paracovirus is emerging as a new associated with gastroenteritis, actually. The paracovirus can, we all can have it, and this, in, as an adult, you, you can have it with a mild disease. You don't feel much affection, but when it happens in the infancy, it might cause a lot of uh, abnormality and derangement to the child. So, uh, in Mansoura University, they done some investigation to get uh, the virus uh, in cases of respiratory infection associated with diarrhea. They, they, they did it by the PCR and the ELISA system in a stool to detect uh, the virus. They want to detect the, the different causes of viral diarrhea. And this is what the result, and it is going as we expect this. You can find that the rotavirus is number one, as all we know that. In, in spite of the admission, uh, administration of a lot of, of vaccination, but still rotavirus is the main cause, followed by the norovirus, astrovirus. Actually, they didn't investigate all the causes for this. Of course, it's, it might be so difficult. But the checks of, for the paracovirus, where they find it in a mixed infection of viral infection, all of them around 19% of the causes of viral diarrhea, but they detect the paracovirus in 5% of cases only paracovirus. And this is, can, uh, can categorize the virus as a causative agent for diarrhea in children. This is what happened in the, during this study. And you can see that children was having diarrhea, 19% of them have uh, paracovirus. 14% is Mexican infection with other enteric virus, and only 5% of the patients, they have single infection with paracovirus. Significant this that we have to be acquainted of this. With emerging new viruses as well, which was a human 
book of virus. This book of virus is usually as, as, as the baricovirus is mainly a respiratory enteric infection. The child might be presented with upper respiratory infection, but he has diarrhea as well. Is this is related to the uh, respiratory infection or no, they investigate the sub uh, subject. Uh, this is happening in the National Research Institute in Egypt, actually, uh, to detect the uh, protozoa or parasitic infection or helminthi associated with infection. And this was the result. They showed that rotavirus was the main cause of this diarrhea. Coming uh, next is the rota and uh, uh, with the adenovirus. They detect both together. To cut it short, they found the uh, POCA virus in uh, uh, around 58% of the cases. Mixed infection was present in 28% with enteric viruses, and the single infection was detected in 30% of patients, and this is what Judge Genome. <coughs> the single infection of human POCA virus in some children coming with acute gastroenteritis will indicate that Human virus could be a main etiological agent for the disease. <clears throat> Recently, in the last, <coughs> excuse me, in the last three years, we all have faced with this the COVID-19, which make a lot of a lot of argument, and maybe I felt some uh, uh, that the medicine is, is is not enough to fight all the disease. And uh, as long as there is development, there is other viral infection coming to us. Uh, but still, inshallah, we can fight it. Anyhow, the study was done in December to show that around one third of children who get COVID infection, they have diarrhea actually. They have uh, mainly gastrointestinal symptoms or including diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Another study was done to show that in some children, the only presentation can be diarrhea. What does it mean? Does, it, does that mean in a, I have to check for the COVID in case it's coming with diarrhea? I think this is, could be done only when we have a COVID-19 surge. Actually, lately, lately they have uh, the health data application have documented that the new emergence of new organisms for the uh, COVID-19 and mutation of it, have shown uh, as Delta and own, uh, Omicron, show that there is, uh, there is no association of COVID with diarrhea. And this study was done in England to show that only children, uh, the children with COVID infection, only 7% was suffering from diarrhea. I think these slides can remind us with this era last year where everybody was exposed to CT for the chest and the abdominal X-ray. The COVID-19 usually come in children with uh, uh, the most common presentation or symptoms of fever, headache, and gastrointestinal symptoms. The management of these cases is as usual as you manage the COVID case. And I think this were exposed before in another lecture. Then I will come to the... Uh, the main item I care for is the morbidity and complication associated with the diarrheal disease. Uh, this research actually of this entity we, we have discussed in our uh, unit in uh, Cairo University. We have all these complications associated with diarrheal diseases. Uh, the most complication we are facing in, in our unit was the severe dehydration and also the severe electrolyte disturbance. I think we get used to see this in ER in our unit. I think this is obvious. A, a baby with severe dehydration, we cannot forget this shape of this child. Usually this patient will come with hypovolemic shock in outpatient part. Now it was easy by training of our, our new doctors and our juniors how to manage this case. I think it has become no problem now if, uh, to face such cases and recognize. Recognizing severe dehydration please is very important and the rapid interference is really a life-saving for such patient. Before we had some problem with management in our patient clinic 
and the accessing of IV line and this, this become more easy now with the introduction of, of intraosseous injection and the needle. And uh, I think the majority of cases now can be managed in the outpatient department. <clears throat> this is a rapid statistic of our admission to the unit. We had uh, almost 15 to 16,000 cases coming to our ER or our, uh, in our ER in, uh, in the unit of gastroenterology only, where they accept the patient coming with diarrheal disease as an emergency. You can find here the admission is very high. You can see in, in months of June, this is the hot weather where there is the associated with a lot of complication. Also, we can, we can see a, a, high, a high incidence which come in months of October, September, October, where there is a, a flourishing of the rotavirus actually. It's responsible for a lot of admission. The days of admission, you can find it high in the spring, in March, and you can find it in June. In March, because I think in, in, in the spring season, there is also flourishing of viral infection. And in June, we have a hot weather. The hottest weather comes in June and patients are exposed to complication. I will go to the electrolyte disturbance, which is a, a really a disaster we face a, a, as a, morbidity, a morbidity sequel of diarrheal disease. Uh, in our unit, uh, patient admitted with electrolyte disturbance was forming around 30%, 36% of all admitted cases to our unit, and 13% of cases admitted to the ICU. You can see the peak here for the admission to the ICU, which comes in months of April. It increased gradually from February to April, and then come down slowly. The cases is admitted with electrolyte disturbance, as you see, is high in the June, as well as we say the weather is hot, and the summer we will have, uh, in, in the spring we will have a lot of cases with uh, diarrheal disease coming to us on flourishing of the virus. The type of electrolyte disturbance we used to have mainly, we, we have all types of electrolyte disturbance, but actually we had two type have seen with electrolyte disturbance. They are the main types presenting to us with what was the hypokalemia and the hypernatremia. The hypokalemia is common because of the losses of the, uh, in the stool is very high with uh, potassium. It is mainly potassium loss when you, you, you found the stool. But the hypernatremia here, I think this mainly could be of mismanagement. And we'll discuss this in coming lecture. You can see this photo with a child coming with severe dehydration and abdominal distinction. They have a generalized hypotonia. This is, can be a spot diagnosis in a child coming with dehydration, gastroenteritis, or diarrheal disease, hypotonic, as you see, with severe abdominal distinction. The management of hypokalemia will be exposed in the next lecture in details. But this photo, what you expect, this could be an electrolyte disturbance causing this disaster. Unfortunately, yes. This patient may come to us with severe electrolyte disturbance with this photo. And I borrow actually uh, these two uh, slides, I borrow from the new coming doctor. We, we used to give lecture to new coming doctor for the type of dehydration and uh, degree of dehydration. You can see that it depends on how much water is lost and how is uh, sodium. And this is give us the importance of sodium in assessing patient with dehydration or diarrhea. As sodium make the main cation in the extracellular fluid. This is very important. Sodium is very important uh, cation in the extracellular, uh, the intravascular space. Hypernatremia. This patient you have seen before, with this gangrene affecting both legs and the face was coming with hypernatremia, unfortunately. Our study and investigation have shown that the main cause for hypernatremia to occur was the abuse of oral 
rehydration solution. In, uh, in Egypt, we do have packets for rehydration of children. Unfortunately, the, the, the mother thinks that the, the, this packet is a medicine. And if she concentrates the solution, she will have a better outcome. They, do, they give the, 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 the solution in a concentrated form so that the child will get better soon. And this is, was a big disaster and lead to a lot of cases with hypernatremia, according to our statistic. The second cause was uh, intravenous rehydration of cases of gastroenteritis without proper electrolyte management. You should, uh, during the other causes, this is an excuse, Yanni. The third one is that they manage cases with severe dehydration. They usually come as acidosis and they give them bicarb actually for and give them fluid for shock. And this is, will raise the sodium. Unfortunately, it was realized this patient comes to us in a worse condition and in a very bad condition with disturbed conscious living. This is a simple review of what happened with hypernatremia. This is a normal cell we should see with the extracellular period containing many sodium, osmolarity is 280 and uh, intracellular osmolarity is 280 as well. When we raise the sodium here to 160, the osmolarity will rise to the double. It will be around 320. The cell has to fight this because otherwise it's, it's, it will shrink and shrink and shrink and it get it become apoptosis will happen then. So the cell start to lose water and it shrink. It might get dead if, if it continues this way. So the cell start to, to make what's known as osmolide. Osmolite, this is to rise the osmolarity and to fight against this shrinkage. So there will be balance between this, between the uh, intravascular and intracellular space. Now, the doctor come and correct the intravascular compartment, our extracellular space, and he drop the sodium to 140 with the osmolarity of the uh, serum osmolarity coming down as well but still the osmolarity is high intracellular. And this is can bring the water inside the cell and lead to edema. And unfortunately, this is edema of the cell, I mean. And this is, can lead to apoptosis as well and death of the cell. What happened to, due to this reaction we, we showed before? The effect of hypernatremia. There will become high, uh, the blood or the, become hyperosmolar intravascular space the mainly affected cell is the brain cell because they are vulnerable to complication, result in cell contraction, as we show in the first in the previous slide, as well as the, 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 the lining of the vascular wall, where cell lining will become affected. We got we can have a generalized vasculitis of wide and narrow vessels, and this is lead to uh, the severe hypernatremic dehydration affecting mainly the brain. The organ which is really affected usually the brain and the patient will start to develop seizure. He might get paralysis and then we get encephalopathy, unfortunately. Brain cell is the most affected cell in this uh, hypernatremia. The complication of hypernatremia, which we get, unfortunately, this, it is a multi-system affection due to the hyperosmolarity of the blood and associated vasculitis all over the circulation. It is followed by cell damage all over the body and can initiate about affect the brain cell or the nervous system, which cannot regenerate. And this is, can lead to disasters with the patient. The common CNS complication we see with this is that there will happen a microinfarction you might have a hyperventilating mission, you manage it and he improve, but still have a sequelae or CNS sequelae. This is happening usually from the myocardial function or minute thrombosis by defecting different brain area. Or you could have from the severe vasculitis, you, have, you can have intracerebral hemorrhage. Brain edema is usually iatrogenic when you have a patient for a long period with hyperlatemia, long period mean more than 24 hours when the cell started to. Uh, uh, form osmolites, and then you give hypotonic solutions, this lead to edema of the cell. The result of this will become 
I generalized in Kefalovsky. This picture of uh, uh, prenedema, and this is a picture of massive infarction. This is for this patient. I'm sorry to show this photo, but I think I have to show it because of the, the disaster of the hypernatremia, how it can lead to. This patient was coming to me with this photo. He was referred from a hospital. He was actually suffering from pneumonia. I will go for this later. And this is the shape of the child. He's not the head rate actually. And, but he has this form and his sodium was very high. And this is the, the, uh, the previous slide we have shown before with another child coming with hypernatremia. He was referred as well from a hospital with this form. And this is what was MRI finding. How to manage such kids? This is what do everybody care about this. Usually, as we said, all these patients will come in a very bad condition. And usually they might require shock therapy. Did you, do you give shock therapy, rapid infusion? Uh, there is a role in management of all our patients is that there is priority. Patient in shock should be managed. Otherwise, you're gonna lose the patient. We use uh, uh, in our uh, department what's called Bansol. This is a solution contain uh, 90 milli equivalent of sodium. Not only this, the patient with uh, uh, diarrhea, with hypernatremia usually come with acidosis. Do you correct the acidosis, this metabolic acidosis by giving sodium by car? Still there is priority. It depends on the uh, le uh, level of acidosis and the pH of the patient. Uh, we usually have a cut point if the patient is having less than 7.1, you may have to interfere. Otherwise, you manage hypernatremic dehydration as usual as we will expose. The key point of management of hypernatremia is that we plan to correct the deficit in a long period. Instead of a six to 12 hours, we might correct the dehydration in four to eight to 72 hours. We use a solution contains 60 milli equivalent. Actually in our unit, we uh, train our uh, staff for a certain, uh, this is, you can say this is uh, a preparation of sodium bicarb with uh, glucose, one to 18. They, so they become ready to infuse the patient when they have it. And uh, mind you that you should plan to correct the deficit in 48 to 72 hours. This patient, unfortunately, our, I mean, it is uh, our luck that we face cases with uh, hypernatremic dehydration. So we have a space to correct the fluid and subsequently we can lower the level of the sodium gradually. But if you are faced with a patient like that, this patient is uh, edematous and he is not dehydrated. This patient actually was referred to our unit from another hospital. He was suffering from respiratory uh, problem. He was, has pneumonia and every time, and he has diarrhea as well, but every time they check for his blood gases, he has metabolic acidosis. So they, they give him bicarb, unfortunately. He was given bicarb many times, but they, 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 they lot, lately check for the sodium and they find the sodium is very high. Uh, so they refer to us with this foot. What you will do then in such patient, how you can manage? And you do, the patient is a dimitis, he doesn't need fluid anymore, fluid. What you will do, you have to manage according to the level of the sodium. If the sodium is very high, you have to consider that you might give, uh, you might go for the peritoneal dialysis or you might correct it slowly, as we said in 48 hours, you, you have to calculate the water deficit. And this is equation we used in our unit, the first one. We calculate the water deficit and replace it in 48 or to 72 hours. But if the level is more than 180, you have to, 180, you have to consider rapid retinal dialysis in such patient. Uh, prevention, it's, it's better to prevent, to reach to these cases. There is rules which say that still ORS is the best way of rehydration. 
But we have to know that the ORS is a drug and should be used under medical supervision. And I thank uh, a lot the, the new the good company with new technology with low sodium concentration in their preparation and the ready preparation to avoid the abuse of the ORS, which comes in powder. We have to know that the commonest cause of hypernatremia, unfortunately, is hydrogenic. And the commonest cause of complication associated with hypernatremia as well is hyper is iatrogenic. One advice I will give that if you decide to use IV fluid, please, please check first for the electrolyte and make a plan for you for follow up. Slow rehydration is a key point to avoid unnecessary complication in hypernatremia. And for emergency, when you come with a patient with shock or severe acidosis that endure your life or have effect on the car uh, and the uh, heart, you there is priority where you interfere. Finally, there is a recommendation that it's very easy to control and avoid this complication and this hazard of morbidity and complicated disease by the health education and the use of mass media to let the people alert, alert of the disease. Hand washing is recommending for all cases to decrease the incidence of diarrheal disease. Reduction of diarrhea-related morbidity depends on identifying and intervention and delivery them to the population at risk, risk which is children under fire. The message we get from this is that diarrhea is a major condition responsible for pediatric morbidity and mortality all over the world, especially in developing country. It's still a challenging clinical condition because of what we were exposed before as it has a heterogeneous etiology and possible severe outcome. The early diagnosis is important and it can save a lot of complication and morbidity from this disease. I think there must be more clinical study and plans to, to fight this disease. And the, for the ethical, uh, I mean consciousness, the American Academy of Pediatric have given this statement. They say that it is not very important to do a, a test for the type of viral or ova or parasite or bacteria when you are faced with a child with diarrhea and outpatient, but it is very important that you check serum electrolyte if you have a patient which, which is disturbed consciousness or having moderate or severe dehydration, especially if he require intravenous fluid. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. Uh, thank you so much to my prof. Uh, it was an excellent presentation and uh, full of uh, yeah, data and uh, I hope that it helped all. I have just uh, one question from Dr. Amira Youssef. If we don't have uh, Bansol, could we use normal sign in shock therapy in a case of hypernatremic dehydration? You, if you are sure that the patient is having hypernatremia, it is better to get a, a, a low concentration and you, you can adjust. I think we all are trained. And you have this, I think, you have uh, one half saline and you have three quarters saline. Go for yes, the three. Well, I have one fifth even. No, we don't avoid the one fifth as much as you can. Go for uh, the quarter or half concentration saline. Don't use a hypotonic solution to avoid the rapid reduction of sodium with each complication. Yes. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. Uh, just wait, I, Keda, I have another. Here. I think I, I, I will go after him for the second picture, if you, if you allow me, please. Uh, just wait, uh, I have just two questions again. Okay. Uh, the use of uh, probiotics for acute diarrhea, do you recommend? And we can just take, it, take them in quickly because we are out of time. We have, we have a lot of study that, that support the use of uh, probiotic in acute cases with diarrhea and decrease. Actually, it, is, it doesn't solve the problem immediately, but it decreases the time and the severity of the disease, according to the study done. Good. Uh, another question I can see now, the, uh, 
you talk about the sodium chloride, uh, sodium bicarb. And severe dehydration due to acute gastroenteritis. I don't understand. What, what do you mean? By induction? He's, he's speaking about the combination you told 1 to 18. You told this you are doing. This, oh, I'm sorry for this, but this is just in case you are sure that there is no hyperkalemia and the patient is have good urine output. And we, we recommend this because usually, as we said before in the, in the lecture, that this patient coming with severe dehydration, they usually have acidosis. This is a very minute amount we, we added to our uh, glucose 5%. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so you want to continue with your second presentation or Dr. Hani can uh, continue? Uh, we will take his place. Let him go first, please, if you want. Time, okay, I will. I will. I I enjoy it actually. Well, uh, I, I'm I'm fine. But maybe I will tell you what. I'm. I, I promise you. I will compensate for you for extra time. So probably uh, <laughs> I will be needing Dr. Nabil just maybe like uh, twenty minutes or so. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. So our next speaker will be Dr. Muhammad Hani Timsah. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Hani Timsah is a professor of pediatrics in King Saudi University Medical City. And he is a member of the child protection team in KC. Dr. Hani will speak to us about the child maltreatment in post pandemic area. Uh, let us go get proactive. Okay, Dr. Hani, you can start. Okay, so Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Again, uh, thank you for the organizing committee for this kind invitation. And I'm, I promise you uh, it will gonna be a very interactive and quick session for, for all of us. Okay, take your time while I was you. And I will show you something really unique about uh, how to tackle. I like the theme that you have chosen, uh, that let's get proactive and what's after the pandemic uh, era. So this is something that we really uh, have to think about at this stage. Again, as you mentioned, Dr. Nabi, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a member of the child protection team and always you talk about the team because this is the main issue of how to tackle uh, any suspected cases. And I have chosen this background in particular just to emphasize that uh, it's really a complex case. Uh, the child maltreatment, it's just maybe sometimes what they describe it as a tip of the iceberg. So uh, there's something beyond what uh, we may see from, from outside, but how we can improve it, how we can progress with our teams. Uh, again, uh, about my topic outlines, I'm going to just briefly touch with each uh, of these uh, outlines. And with each slide, I'm going to share with you, there will be a QR code. So the colleagues can share, can either take a screenshot or they can scan the code. I will suggest a screenshot and then uh, because maybe they are watching on the mobiles and they can, then they can go through that papers. I have chosen specific papers on each one of these uh, items. And I'm just gonna touch base on it because uh, what I'll be focusing about is actually about this, how to integrate the AI technology. Probably many of you have heard about how to use artificial intelligence in medicine, in medical education. So I'm gonna show you a live demo today of what this technology could help us in the child maltreatment per se, how, we can, how it can help us. As an initial disclosure, I have no conflicts of interest to, uh, to declare. Again, thinking about why this topic is important for us, of course, the recognition of child maltreatment and how it can, uh, how we can uh, either prevent it or uh, manage it appropriately. It's gonna avoid long-term negative outcomes for both the child and uh, her or his family. And uh, you can think about several examples that you have uh, met uh, most of the colleagues surely have seen uh, cases of physical, behavioral, emotional, and uh, even occasionally sexual uh, abuse. So all of these, uh, avoiding them. Uh, so we need the healthcare providers. Uh, the healthcare providers in pediatrics, these are, I like to call them the lawyers. You are, so we are the lawyers for these children to early recognize them and early alert our child protection team, whether it is we are part of it or we are just uh, people who will just signal there could be something wrong. 
the impact of the pandemic. And this is my first QR code, uh, if colleagues want a screenshot. So the impact of the pandemic was uh, significant. And uh, again, uh, this is a global issue. The WHO estimates that 1 billion children experience physical, sexual, or psychological abuse uh, every year. And uh, there, there is extensive discussion in this, uh, in this first uh, website of the WHO about uh, how issues uh, could be tackled to decrease the, uh, uh, the risks of child maltreatment. And also there is overview of some uh, key statistics and trends that relate to child maltreatment during the pandemic and after that. Which types of child abuse occur during the pandemic? Of course, during the stress of the COVID-19, uh, there was uh, financial stress, there was physical distancing, people were uh, staying at home more frequently, children were not going to schools uh, physically, so they were more at home, there were more incidents of uh, child abuse, and this was described extensively in the literature. Uh, and this is a research uh, we had with uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Shilouhi haler -Nizi, where he reported on the uh, Saudi National Family Safety Program, and you can access the open uh, access paper through this uh, QR code. And uh, there was a consideration about the COVID pandemic, and uh, Though, although we have seen uh, uh, the number of cases may have been altered, so the number of cases may be lo lower than before, but the cases, uh, the type of cases, they were different. And uh, we concluded at that time that specific risk factors for child maltreatment, both for the children and the perpetrators, needs to be uh, looked at. And uh, the, uh, advocating for a proactive system uh, to screen and document the child maltreatment with a higher degree of integration with the community reporting systems. So this is probably part of the uh, main messages I would like to com uh, I would like to communicate with my colleagues, and of course with the early recognition of maltreatment, this is uh, very important for us. And here I put for you another QR code. If you can uh, do a screenshot now, dear colleagues. This is about the executive uh, regulations of, uh, uh, of the uh, child protection law in uh, Saudi Arabia. So this is from the Ministry of Social Affairs and uh, the detailed discussions of the steps how healthcare providers can take to recognize child maltreatment, including how to conduct the interviews, observing physical symptoms, conducting tests and screening and also examples of healthcare providers, how we can work with the families in synchrony with the families to uh, improve the outcomes. Uh, this is uh, another uh, paper that came after the pandemic 2022, uh, the, about the early recognition of child abuse through screening indicators at the emergency department in which uh, Ofidani et al described a screening tool that was essential and uh, productive for the early recognition of victims of abuse and their in-depth analysis of suspected cases through the standardized methods, such as the clinical pathway, allowed them to reach a quicker diagnosis and more accurate diagnosis. And there are several hospitals that have started to implement such screening tools, even inside their uh, electronic health records, so EHR. And many hospitals already started to implement, uh, implement these as a screening tools to pick up early, even if we, we don't start to suspect ourselves as a clinicians, physicians, healthcare workers, nurses, before we suspect. So also the system could help to uh, at least flag or alert the medical team that it, uh, there could be some abuse taking part. What about the early interventions in cases of child maltreatment? Uh, the, of course, uh, we need uh, some overview of the steps uh, in which uh, we can take uh, whenever we suspect abuse, including the reporting to the appropriate authorities and providing the support and resources to the child and uh, his or her family. With discussion of how early intervention can prevent further harm and improve the outcomes of children. And if you can take another screenshot of this QR code, it will take you to this child maltreatment 
when to suspect a maltreatment in children under 18. And uh, this is a nice uh, clinical guidelines, which was originally published in 2009, but the latest update was 2017. And it has very nice uh, uh, summary of when to, uh, when to suspect and what to suspect. Uh, so this is a nice summary if you are looking for more uh, theoretical background to support uh, your uh, knowledge and uh, update your uh, knowledge. So what about preventing a child maltreatment? Uh, let's imagine now I'm going to take you to a new chapter, totally new chapter. And here is the interactive session. I promise you that uh, hopefully will be brief and I will share with you uh, what it will show. So this is, if you can screenshot uh, this, or uh, uh, if you can screen this QR code in your mobiles, if you can and open it, open this link. It's gonna take you to an overview of prevention. So uh, I'm gonna just switch the screens here to another screen and I will show you what do I mean by that. So I'm gonna take you now to uh, a QR code uh, to an AI model. And uh, where is that AI model in my screen? Okay, so this is the AI model I'm talking about, uh, which is, uh, this is a, uh, one of the uh, artificial intelligence uh, search engines that you may start to utilize in your clinical setting. So you just open, uh, and it's open access. You can just open here, you.com and uh, type your question here at the start. For example, I put it here, the question is the same that what we have put in my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I would like to have some overview of prevention strategies. And then it gave me, uh, this is an automated message. And then I will ask him, for example, and uh, ask him with references. So I will be more uh, scientific. So, and immediately, if you can see now, this is a live demo. This is now what the AI is telling me about uh, the question I asked with some suggested references. The only caveat here, the only issue to keep an eye, just double check that these, these references are accurate because sometimes the AI, it can give you a fake or a not accurate references. So this is the only issue I will alert my colleagues to keep an eye when you are using such an AI model. Let me take you to another AI model. Uh, so I'm going to switch the gear to another. Uh, uh, this is the chat GPT. Probably many of you have heard about it. Okay, this one requires some uh, uh, subscription, uh, subscription just mainly to, to link it to a mobile number. However, when you put here, for example, I asked for prevention strategies. And this is what the machine learning told me uh, or uh, verbalized for me. Now this website, it may give you less, uh, less likely to give you an accurate references here. I will try to ask it to generate references. I'm just gonna type references here. If you can see with me the screen, okay. And then the AI now it's typing with me. If you can see, these are the references, but I would rather just keep an eye and double check if the references are accurate or not. So uh, with this, I'm gonna just uh, end the demo here and go back to my slides with your permission. Back to my slides. I hope it is smooth, okay. So this was just a demo of what in the future, what we may see again. So the future directions with the AI integration, I think we're gonna see more advancements in the technology, including the AI integration, uh, not only in uh, our knowledge how to prevent and intervene in cases of, of, of child maltreatment, but also how the AI can help us to identify children at risk. As I told you, many hospitals, they have now in place uh, models, uh, EHR, electronic health records models, which can pick up early this child abuse uh, potentials. Again, we are just talking about suspicion of child abuse, of course. And uh, if you can screen, please, another screenshot for this uh, survey. This is a two minute survey about the chat GPT, the one I just show you now. And at the end of the survey, you will be directed to more information if you want to know more about this 
uh, artificial intelligence models, the chat GPT. It will, after the two minute survey, it will take you to that specific video. I'm sure it's uh, in the next few months, you will see, you, it will be very useful for all of us as a healthcare pro uh, providers, whether in pediatrics, child abuse, or other fields in our medical practice. So in summary, and uh, I promise you, I'm gonna be very brief and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. In summary, it is important to take a proactive approach so proactive, as uh, the model says, that I need not only active, I need to be more proactive in improving my uh, medical expertise and my team's expertise and experience and skills and how to, uh, how to report any suspected cases to the, uh, to the appropriate uh, agencies. Also, as healthcare providers, all of us play a vital role in this early recognition and intervention. And I do hope we have more, more and more uh, society uh, 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 campaigns just to explain to the people that if a, if a newborn is crying, she needs to know that this is normal for uh, babies to cry, even if it is infantile colic. So the, the main issue is uh, how, to, how the people can uh, really know how to manage any child's behavior without doing any harm or maltreatment. And the advancements in technology, including the AI integration, may hold promise for the prevention and intervention of suspected cases of child maltreatment. And as I, I, I will just conclude here with this is my email if anyone wants to have any further questions. And thank you for protecting our children. Thank you all, and uh, I will just silence my mic for a minute, Dr. Nabil. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Muhammad, for your interesting presentation. And also, actually, for, for me, I was searching for you since a long time, but I did not know that there is a protection team. Uh, just my comment here, is the reporting in Saudi Arabia is going well and the reporter is protected? Yes. So the reporting, as you mean, as a team for suspected yeah. cases? Now, for example, I am in the ER. I faced a case with a high suspicious of a child abuse. And I want to report the case. In Europe, it was very easy to call the team and the report, and you will not face any problem. Now, I, am, I just want to ask, what about the situation here? And I'm not just taking the, the, the experience of the governmental hostel, because in the governmental hostel, you are more protected than us in the private sector. I, see. I, will, I will put myself now in the situation that I'm in ER of a private hospital. I faced a sick baby. Then during my examination, I have a high suspicious that this is a child abuse. It can be from anyone, it can be from the family, can be from the server, servant, can be from anyone. What, how is the channel to activate or to report the case? And what will be the impact on me? Can I be protected by any, by law, by, by anyone or not? If this family will take an, an action against me. Okay, so beautiful. So uh, the protection for the child uh, abuse team by law, it is there, okay? And uh, this is very highly written, very clearly written. And that's uh, one of the, uh, I can share maybe uh, the slides, one of the slides I shared also about the teams. Now the integration of the teams is improving over the years. This is what I can say. Uh, uh, what I, I'm not sure about the private sectors. I know the governmental sectors. So there are uh, child protection uh, team a hospital so there is like uh, i think about 50 hospitals which are designated uh, for child protection teams that team of course it consists of not only physician there is a social worker and sometimes psych uh, psychiatrists are involved this is uh, what's in our setting uh, the there is a reporting system but about the going into uh, any disharmony with the with the family uh, what i know if there is anything uh, which could be uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, life uh, 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 risk for the life of the patient. So something impending uh, risk 
which could uh, yeah, life threatening life threatening yes you are fully protected and uh, even that the family cannot sign uh, dama even or lama it depends on what the hospital call it so if it is life threatening if it's not life threatening i will just suggest to go with the social workers channels and there is a report even if it is uh, the abuse neglect so the reporting once it's reported it's followed up the the good news if it is reported because why the reporting also protects you because once the patient goes outside the hospital he's not under your umbrella anymore he goes under the umbrella of the uh, national family safety program which they have it and they can follow up uh, with the patients when even if they go out at home again uh, i can confirm with you uh, for you about the private uh, hospitals the process i can confirm it and i will share it with you and maybe you can share later with the candidates, with the participants. Yeah, sure, we will have uh, a good communication after this. And this is my first time, actually. Uh, and what I understood from your uh, lecture, uh, I saw that you will speak about maltreatment medically. I did not uh, went to the child abuse. <laughs> That's why when you started, I collect my thoughts that will child it will be about child abuse, not the medical maltreatment or uh, any medications. This is what I mean. Oh, okay. I have one question now from uh, one of the audience. Uh, what is the role of the child protective society in case of family refuse refusal of treatment as chemotherapy or malignancy? Mm. Full malignancy. Okay, so that's an important question, and we face it every now and then. Uh, uh, again, uh, especially if it is advanced malignancy, uh, sometimes uh, let me give you share with you one example about a patient uh, who was advanced, uh, advanced uh, one form of malignancy, and the treatment was only uh, palliative care. So, what, part of the palliative chemotherapy to be given. However, the family was asking, no, we don't want that treatment. I want to take him for alternate medicine, uh, you know, like uh, herbs and the other, so alternate medicine. So the family was not actually refusing the treatment, but they were switching from one treatment, which I cannot prove that it is helpful, to another treatment, which, uh, again, I cannot prove if it's helpful, but I don't want something harmful. So something if the family wants to go to cautery for the patient and I think that could be a, a physical abuse for the patient. I can uh, bring the team, uh, the team on board. Uh, uh, of course, there is no one size fits all. So I cannot give an answer which will be universal answer. Each uh, abuse or suspected abuse case, we tackle it for each patient per se. So some, uh, even sometimes it happens in families, of course, as you know. So we'll have to take each individual sibling and tackle his uh, problem alone. Now, if that, uh, if that treatment is life-saving, like a chemotherapy, let's say for an early stage leukemia, so that could be a life-saving. Uh, then, uh, of course, there is re-counseling. Re and sometimes we have asked even the social workers to bring us uh, some support from the ministry to give more a uh, more uh, informed, informed consent for the parents. Uh, but again, the parents' rights uh, override uh, our right to, we cannot force them to give chemotherapy, but we have to have, a, again, counseling and counseling, and several times it is successful. So I hope that answers the question to the best of my ability. Uh, Anything else, Dr. Nabil? Sorry, you are muted, I guess. Uh, yeah, yes, okay. well, it's, uh, it's clear now. Uh, I don't have any other questions so far. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, inshallah, allow me to have a personal contact with you in the My many... Honor. And any colleagues uh, who are willing to uh, anything, uh, they have any questions, they have my email there with best wishes of all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, and thanks for thank being you, with us. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. So now we will go back to our professor, Dr. Mazhar Ashur. He will continue with his second lecture. Uh, it will be uh, with an approach to critically ill child with fluid and electrolyte uh, the arrangement. Okay, Dr. Mazar, you can start, make just full screen and start. Thank you.
Yes, uh, good evening again. It's me again here. Uh, I would like to thank all the attendants again for their attendance and their patience with us for this for the last long lectures. In the previous talk, we have talked about how is electrolyte disturbance can make a hazards in patients with diarrheal disease. We expose the commonest problem happen with uh, diarrheal disease considering electrolyte derangement. But all of us known as an intensivist that we face a lot of electrolyte disturbance associated with other systemic affection, uh, systemic affection in a critically ill patient. Usually they have a sort of electrolyte derangement and this is, can be a key in management of these cases who are critically ill. Uh, but uh, I, I want to give a note here that this lecture was made to be an interactive lecture. According to the instruction of Dr. Nabil, he wanted the, the, the talk to be mainly practical and applied clinically. Uh, um, after the last lecture, we heard from uh, Dr. Hani that there's a lot of technology that we can make it interactive. But actually, I didn't have this technology. I wish I can have it uh, uh, like how he exposed this to us. Uh, so allow me to talk uh, about uh, cases I, we face in the ICU and the BQ. In such uh, cases, they have uh, uh, considerable electrolyte disturbance. We recognize common fluid and electrolyte disturbance. We will try to list a diagnostic strategy for this disorder and we'll go through with management principles. Principles only will not go into details. I will start with the first case. This is a three months old child in the Biko. He is coming for chalk following a two day history of fever. In short, he was diagnosed as uh, meningitis as, a, as his CSF was positive for streptococcal pneumonia. Uh, during our round that uh, it was realized that the patient is having a decreasing urine output. Uh, this means urogoria. We what, what do you think we have to do now? We have to have a differential diagnosis for patient with meningitis and he's suffering from oligoria. We'll go with the oligoria. Oligoria then can be a prenatal cause, a postrenal cause, or a renal cause. This patient can have uh, prenatal cause as he was in shock with diminished intravascular volume, yes. Could be a postrenal, yes, because he has full scassiter as a, a, a case of meningitis in the ICU with obstruction, or he could have acute tubular necrosis because he has severe infection and could lead to acute renal failure. Or at last, we have to consider the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. What's next to do? We have to do some diagnostic study to see what this patient is having. The usual start lab you, you ask for is the blood gases, serum electrolytes, serum osmolarity, serum glucose, blood urea, nitrogen, crea. And you always, you have to ask for urinary study when the patient is having a urinary problem. At least you have to do a checkup for this. And this is what our results actually. His sodium was low, as you see. His osmolarity was low, the serum osmolarity. In spite of this, we expect to have a urinary osmolarity that it should be low as well, but it is high. And the patient is having increased fractionated sodium excretion. This is the primary things we find in our case. He's suffering from hyponatremia, and the patient is having a source of oliguria with inappropriately concentrated urine. Concentrated urine means here that we have oliguria, but we have elevated specific gravity, increased sodium excretion, and high urinary osmolarity. We go to the differential diagnosis. What do you expect? Is the patient is having a prenatal cause, is having a postrenal, or could have an acute renal insult or cyan. We go for the cyan. Why? Because we have to know the physiological condition in which 
the antidiuretic hormone should go. The antidiuretic hormone should be res in response to hypertonicity or in a life-threatening hypotension or decreased perfusion. But in our cases, we have seen abnormally concent uh, hyponatremia, on the contrary, we have seen oliguria and concentrated urine. This is can go with a cyan or syndrome of an aberrant antidiuretic hormone secretion. What causes us this syndrome? Uh, we can see here a variable etiology, but we uh, we can choose if if our patient if our case can go with this. Yes, it can go, be patients having infection, and mainly infection is in the CNS disorder. The treatment for such patient, the diagnosis was confirmed, and treatment was fluid restriction for such patient and daily weight loss and follow up. Usually, the intensivists know that the condition will not end this way. And this is what really happened in our case. Four hours after beginning of fluid restriction, we are called because the patient developed seizure. And he actually received two doses of midazolam and a loading dose of phenytoin and he's still seizuring. What do you expect them to be? It could be a systemic or symptomatic seizure, either due to hypertension medication, or the patient is having another electrolyte disturbance, or the patient, the meningitis is worsening, or he had intracranial event, maybe he have intracranial hemorrhage or thrombus or infarction, or actually he could, the, the hyperdatremia is getting worse. Why you should suspect this? Because the patient is not responding to uh, 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 anticonvulsive, conventional anticonvulsive, uh, convulsion therapy. It's not responding well. So if I were you, I will ask for the serum sodium as a stat emergency uh, call. And this is what really happened when we asked for the serum sodium, it was very low. It was 170. What do you expect to do next? How can you manage this? You have to correct this sodium because it is less then 117, and the patient is, is, sympt is symptomatic then with symptomatic seizure. The treatment actually, or our control of this seizure is come through the correction of this severe hyponatremia. This is uh, this equation, I think all of, know, of us know how to correct. The, we, uh, the maximum correction for us will be on the 20, uh, 125. We decrease it by our measurement. Uh, uh, then uh, multiply by the weight and the water content. And this is what the result for our cases was that the patient has a deficit of sodium, uh, or, uh, or he has deficit of sodium of 38.4 milli equivalent. The patient's in Caesar and you have to control the Caesar. You divide, the, you have to raise the sodium as much as you can, as much as you can mean minimum in two to three hours. So we go to the equation and we, uh, uh, and supposing that the defect is only five, but sorry, multiplying by the weight, by multiplying by the way, uh, uh, the water content of the body, you would need 24 mil equivalent of sodium. Sodium chloride as 3%, as we all know, contain only each one ml will contain 0.5 milli equivalent per liter, so that will give him 48 milli, and this is, can be infused over three to uh, uh, two to three hours, then followed by slow infusion. And this is enough for this case. We will shift to another case now. We have a five years old child. He was exposed to car accident two days ago, and he uh, was diagnosed as uh, having intraventricular hemorrhage with multiple large uh, cerebral confusion. Three hours ago, he has an episode of hypotension. His main arterial pressure was five and that needs intravascular fluid uh, uh, infusion and blast epinephrine infusion. And he has uh, his blood, his intracranial pressure was high as 19. Then over the last two hours, the nurse notes that the patient is having a lot of urine. Uh, they calculate the urine output and it was around nearly 8 ml per kg per hour. We go for the conventional qu question, what's your differential diagnosis? Patient is having a CNS problem, a trauma, and he's having a polyuria. What do you do? 
uh, lab investigation. Lab investigation, usually we go for the routine, but we'll go for the differential diagnosis of polyuria. Polyuria could means there's deficient antidiuretic secretion hormone. It either could be nephrogenic or central or primary bulidopsia or suyut diuretic. The lower things is doesn't go with our case, but we can go with this. I think we have to, to, uh, to investigate such condition. We have to investigate why is the polyuria then? You do, as we said, the routine investigation, which is blood gases, serum electrolyte, serum osmolarity, as usual as we did before. And then you have to do the urinary study for the polyuria. This was the result, our result. We had a high sodium, we had a high osmolarity, but unfortunately, we have a diluted urine with a urine specific gravity low and a urine osmolarity was low as well. We have a hypernatremic patient, and in spite of that, he has polyuria with an appropriately diluted urine. What's the likely explanation for this? It's not, it could be really a diabetes, yani the fact of antidiuretic hormone, which goes in our patient, I think this is, can go with the central diabetes in symptoms because the patient is having trauma affecting the central nervous system. You have to have a high level of suspicion to diagnose such cases. Uh, polyuria, inappropriately dilute urine, and this is usually come with trauma, and we, we, we have seen this also with brain dead patient. The next thing is how you manage such case. You have to replace what's uh, deficient, the vasopressin infusion, and you uh, calculating the, the patient weight and calculating the urine hour put follow up for the patient chart. But you have to warn about the development of hyponatremia. This is case number three. I have, we had an eight months old infant owner. He's a polycystic kidney disease and he is in peritoneal dialysis by nine. We do lab investigation before the dialysis and there was an alarm coming for us from the lab technician that the potassium is 7.1 milli equivalent and uh, 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 the sample is not hemolyzed. This is a, a, an emergency interference. What we do usually in such case, immediately we have to interfere because this is a life-threatening condition. We'll repeat the serum, sodium immediately, as well as we'll ask for an ECG for such patient. And if you have any potassium in infusion or oral intake, you have to stop it immediately. This is a hyperkalemic patient. And this is what the ECG finding. We have a tall peak T wave, shortened QR to the band, typical case of hyperkalemia. And this is his ECG uh, we have seen. This is a hyperkalemia with ECG sin. You have to interfere immediately to treat the hyperkalemia. First thing that you have to do is to antagonize the effect of the hyperkalemia on uh, the cardiac uh, membrane that can lead to arrest of the patient. You, you can start to give the patient calcium gluconate. Then we'll try what's rapidly done to decrease the intravascular Potassium content is that oh, we all know this procedure is a glucose insulin uh, technique with alkalinization of the blood. Some people would go with using of beta agonist, beta 2 agonist, which is uh, salputamol. You can use it by inhalation or you can use it by IV. In my own experience, it, it gives good results for controlling of the disaster effect of the hyperkalemia. But actually, Body to on such cases. Either you do the dialysis or you go for the sodium kaexili. Uh, to my experience, <clears throat> in patient with, with high potassium and uh, ECG changes, if you have the ability to do immediate dialysis you, and use other uh, protective measurements, you will succeed to control this patient. Otherwise, you're going to be, lose the patient. The, the fourth case here we have is a child coming to us recovering from septic shock. 
uh, during this shock, he received 150 ml per kg intravenous. But unfortunately, the patient developed an sarca. So he was started on Lasix infusion. But uh, unfortunately, the patient started to, severe, to suffer from severe weakness up to hypoventilation. And uh, he was on monitor. So we have realized the presence of PVCs in the cardiac monitor. As uh, this is an emergency, of course, of BVCs at the cardiac monitor, means that you have to, inter to interfere immediately. We ask immediately for tests. Actually, this is was the chalk that we found the potassium is very low in such patient, <coughs> reach to 2.4. And this is was really mainly related to the infusion of diuretics. This is the ECG of, of our patient, the flattening of the and inversion of T wave and the appearance of the U wave in such patient is diagnostic of hypokalemia. Excuse me. <clears throat> diagnostic of hypokalemia that necessitate rapid interference. In such cases, as you see, we have hypokalemia, generalized hypotonia, ECG changes. We treat with, uh, I used to give, if the patient is alert, and can receive any volume of uh, potassium serum you give him, but be worried about the diarrhea and the uh, disturbed gastrointestinal movement that can be associated with such patient. Get an IV line as much as you can. We all know that you are not only allowed with a concentration of potassium in the solution of 40 to 60 milli in the peripheral line, but if you have a central line, you can give the patient uh, around one milli equivalent per kg over one or three hours. You have to correct the hypokalemia immediately and worry about the magnesium. Deal with the magnesium as well in such patient according to your result. We move to the fifth case, our case, and this is gonna be the last case, so I will not uh, be pouring in, in the presenting of these cases. This is a say, this case we face it every day in our practice is a patient coming with severe asthma. He has severe asthma that he necessitated his ventilation in the last two weeks, actually. But he's coming now with vomiting and diarrhea. He is a home medication of uh, Alpitrol, Solpitrol, Flucatazone, and he is an oral prednisone. The physical finding of this patient is that his blood pressure is low, his heart rate is high, his respiratory rate is around 40 and he has a fever. He's lethargic, poor perfusion, cold extremities, motel, capillary field is high and no other systemic abnormality. We can get that the major abnormality in this patient is that he has a previous hospital admission. He has vomiting diarrhea, he's in medication and the patient is having tachypnea, tachycardia, hypotension. And this is a very alarming sign for the patient. No, it's come the, the, the very alarming sign that was coming with the poor perfusion and increased capillary fill uh, more than three seconds. What's your differential diagnosis? Immediately, this is a case of shock and you have to interfere immediately. But why this patient developed shock? He's not dehydrated, he doesn't have sepsis. Rule out this. The, the, this is the possibility of shock the, in such patient. Is it cardiogenic? I don't think. According to physical examination, the patient is, is hypovolemic. Maybe they do as long as he has diarrhea and, and vomiting, but according to the physical examination, patient is not dehydrated or distributive shock is anaphylaxis. There is no drug for such patient and maybe sepsis. We'll check this by the CBC and CRB and we'll ask immediately for blood gas, serum, electrolyte, blood urea, nitrogen, glucose, as we usually ask for. And this was the result of our case. He has a low sodium. His potassium is high, not very high, but he has hypoglycemia and acidosis. His, his CBC not show much, didn't show much increment, only the TLC was a little bit high and the CRB was negative and chest X-ray was normal and nothing found in this. You have to have a high level of suspicion in such patient. He's hyponatremic. He's the uh, he's uh, uh, hypoglycemic. He's he has hyperkalemia, acidosis, azotemia. What do you think? This comes with 
in such case. And I will remind you again that the child is on medication. The hydration, hypotonia, hypotension, shock out of proportion to the severity of illness. Shock out of proportion to the severity of illness. Patient is having abdominal pain, unexplained fever, hypoglycemia, hyperatremia, hyperkalemia, azotemia. This is, can go with one item only with acute adrenal insufficiency. The major hormonal factor precipitating this crisis, usually the mineralocorticoid deficiency in such patient. Primary, uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency can be adre uh, primary, and this is what we see in, in Eunice with Dr. Nabil actually or can be secondary other insufficiency due to STH deficiency. This is we usually see with central causes as panhypoglycemia, or as related with a tumor or something like that. Or tertiary, tertiary or iatrogenic come with the suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis due to chronic use of steroid. What do you think this is our case? I think this is our case. What you should treat this patient, as we said before in the previous lecture, you don't wait for confirmatory lab priority. There is priority. You have to handle uh, as much as you can the chalk. You give fluid resuscitation. You can here use the isotonic saline, treat the hypoglycemia immediately, and you can do a glucose replacement, or you can use a mineral or corticoidal for RNF. And ask at this point, you have to ask for the help of the endocrinologist. <clears throat> but to reach to a diagnosis of tertiary other insufficiency, you should have a critical level of suspicion in all patients with shock. If it is not explained with the severity of disease you are facing in patient. Uh, our message we want, I want to give that disorder of sodium and water and potassium is common in critically ill patient, diagnostic approach must consider carefully for each patient. Strict attention to details is important in providing effective therapy. Thank you all for uh, tolerating me for uh, this lecture. Thank you all for your attention and for your time. And I hope that it was beneficial. Uh, I would like at, uh, to thank the fellow panelists for their valuable effort to make this meeting valuable to everybody. And we'll see you next year, inshallah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mazhar. And uh, yeah, I hope, inshallah, we will have you all the time with us. Uh, maybe next time we will be physical. Uh, we enjoyed uh, too much your uh, presentations and uh, your lectures. Uh, it can be a little bit uh, difficult for uh, general pediatricians, but it's very important uh, that uh, the take home medicine, uh, you start early and uh, treat electrolyte imbalance and the shock, and it's better to refer any patient uh, for those who are to the subspeciality early. Uh, don't take time until the patient will lose and is about to lose his wife, his life, then you will transfer. So I don't have so any questions, so I thank you so much and uh, thank you for, for being with us. And I hope, inshallah, everything will be good and the, everyone will take your uh, advice seriously. Thank you very much. You. See you next year, inshallah. Thank you, sir. Can I stop sharing? So we will continue. Our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Yasser Qazaz. Dr. Yasser Qazaz is a pediatric critical care and cardiac critical care consultant with a subspeciality fellowship in extracorporeal life support uh, at King Abdullah Specialized Hospital, Children's Hospital, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, he is the program director of the Pediatric Critical Care Fellowship uh, in uh, Saudi Council, uh, and he is a member of Pediatric Critical Care Fellow, uh, Fellowship and Pediatric Cardiac Critical Care Fellowship Scientific Committee in Saudi Commissions for Health Specialists. Uh, Dr. Yasser will speak to us about the traumatic brain injury 
in PICU. Welcome, Dr. Yasser, and uh, I hope that we did not disturb you uh, off day and concern on Tayyip and Nasbet Yom Tassis. Thank you very much, Dr. Nabil. Uh, I would like to thank you first for giving me the chance to be here with you today uh, and present uh, about traumatic brain injury. It's, it's really my pleasure. So I'm just going to take the next half an hour to go over the evidence base uh, with clinical uh, correlation of what you do with patients with severe traumatic brain injury, the patients who come to the ICU. So uh, traumatic brain injury, yes, you can see my slides, correct? But make full screen, please. It is full screen. Not mm -hmm. yet. Are you at oh, oh. Now is it full screen? Yes. Oh, perfect. Yes. So uh, traumatic brain injury uh, still remains the most common cause of death and disability in children. So basically, one out of five children with severe traumatic brain injury uh, dies, unfortunately. And the data from Saudi Arabia, actually from Kirin Gabdulaziz Medical City, where I work, where they looked into the pediatrics trauma in general. 40% of trauma patients in the hospital admitted were actual pediatrics below 18 years of age. One third of those had traumatic brain injury. And the most common causes were, of course, motor vehicle accident and pedestrian injury, and the mortality there was 15%, so almost one out of six. When we talk about severe traumatic brain injury, it's basically based on Glasgow Coma Scale, who patients will present with a Glasgow Coma Scale of 8 and below. And when they're 9 to 12, it's moderate, and it's miles 13 to 15. So just before we we go into the, the evidence base and how we manage, just a few principles. So uh, the, the, the cranium of the skull has three main tissues inside them, which is the brain 80%, CSF 10%, and blood 10%, and it's a closed, closed space. So, however, if there is one space that needs to expand, a bleeding, for example, or, or brain that swells, there is not a lot of space. So if a volume has to increase, there's going to be increased dramatic in pressure. So it's not one volume is going to increase the pressure by one. Actually, at some point, any volume is going to increase the pressure dramatically. Uh, in terms of the other uh, factors that we looked at, the perfusion and uh, pressure autoregulation. So our brain is completely isolated from our body in terms of autoregulation. If we're really hypertensive, the brain is gonna decrease the blood flow going uh, to the brain. If we're really hypotensive, the brain is gonna dilate the brain vessels to get more blood into the brain. So there is what we call an autoregulation. So our brain maintains its own perfusion on its own through a blood brain barrier. So if there is a pressure anyway, and this is adult from 50 to 150, the brain is gonna manage its own perfusion with no problem. However, if we exceed the 150 or below, below 50 for a blood pressure, then the brain cannot do anything about it. And basically what happens that the, the brain is gonna lose its, its blood perfusion, either too much blood or not enough blood. And in cases of trauma, around 40% of patients with severe traumatic brain injury are gonna lose this autoregulation. So they cannot control how much blood and how they perfuse their brain anymore. And that's where ICU comes in to try to control their blood pressure in a certain range to perfuse their brain. The pathophysiology, so as you know, initially when there are trauma initially occurs, that there is an injury that occurs, we cannot do anything about it. It's the focal brain injury, where it's just, there's a brain contusion or a bleeding, interparenchymal, subdural, epidural, subarachnoid. That's already occurred. We can't deal with it surgically to drain the bleed, but that has already done, or a diffuse brain injury. However, there is secondary brain injury to multiple reasons. So after the primary injury, and that occurs from the time, from the scene till the patient is in ICU and the first few days of ICU, change in temperature, or hypothermia, or hypothermia, acidosis, increased CO2 with hypercarbia, or decreased oxygen with hypoxia, unfortunately, infection in the ICU, intracranial hypertension, hypotension, seizures, there is all again increase the brain injury that occurred. So the primary brain injury occurred, but the secondary brain injury is as important. And the premise of traumatic brain injury care in the ICU, the fundamental goal of our care in the ICU is to identify those, prevent them, and treat them if they occur. So any secondary insults should not occur any time between the, the scene and the ICU care in the first few days. So the evidence-based evidence approach to traumatic brain injury, I just want to give you a reflection of how 
un it's very hard to do evidence-based studies and randomized control trial. So this is one of the biggest trial to look into traumatic brain injury. It's the hypothermia after traumatic brain injury where hypothermia thought to work. It actually is, is a study that occurred in Canada and Europe over 17 ICUs. It took them six years to, just to randomize 225 patients, children, which is like 2.2 patients per year. So it's it's very hard to create a very solid randomized controlled dose evidence base. However, there's physiological and pathological, pathophysiological measures that can help us. So the evidence base basically, uh, and this uh, uh, summarize how we practice. This is David Sackett, uh, one of the pioneers of evidence base actually in Oxford um, and, and McMaster. Basically he says evidence-based medicine is not a cookbook medicine because it requires a bottom-up approach. So the best external evidence from studies, individual clinic expertise where we come as physicians, we know what works and what not, and patient choice. So it's really individualized care that matters. Uh, and it's not only one size fits all. So traumatic brain injury, we're lucky that there has been the guidelines to manage traumatic brain injury, a consensus group that started in 2003, and it has been updated twice so far. It starts by new monitoring, and there is several new monitoring, invasive and non-invasive. So what the guidelines say about intracranial pressure, again, it's a level three recommendation, not backed up by a of evidence. It's, they say it's ICP is suggested to be used. So if you have a patient whose GCS is eight and below, and you're imagining as a case of severe traumatic brain injury, a bad traumatic brain injury, what they recommend is intracranial pressure in any form, either an EVD, extraventricular drain, or interparenchymal drainage. And what they recommend, if there is an ICP and you're monitoring the intracranial pressure, you should allow only the patient to be up to 20 millimeter mercury. You should not go above that, and that should be our treatment threshold. What is the evidence behind all of that? So the biggest evidence that we have comes actually from adult, where a study was done in Latin America and four countries, and basically they compared either ICP monitoring, patients you have a continuous intracranial pressure monitoring, or they're just doing clinical exam, looking at their pupils, at their GSS, at their peripheral neurological examination, and, and they wanted to look into the difference between outcomes. Outcomes, unfortunately, did not change. What, However, what, if, what changed was the aggressiveness of treatment. So the patient who had ICP monitoring had less treatments for high ICP. I'm gonna go, go with the treatments and they stayed less in the ICU. So it did not change the outcomes. However, people who criticize this uh, article or this study say that those countries actually, it was their first time ever to have ICP monitoring. So they are not used to ICP. They have limited post-critical care rehab services, which we know improve the outcome significantly. And in that study, the mortality rate almost was 40%, which is higher than other studies. So they say the funding of this study cannot be generalized to the whole world. Cerebral perfusion pressure, what, what the art one, what cerebral perfusion pressure is, is the mean blood pressure. So you need an arterial line to measure the mean blood pressure minus the intracranial pressure. So if we have a mean blood pressure of 70 and your intracranial pressure is 20, the cerebral perfusion pressure is 50. So what, what is the cerebral perfusion pressure that we target? Again, if we have intracranial pressure monitoring. So they, the guidelines says, you know what, we recommend anywhere between 40 to 50 based on age. So if you, if you have a neonate or young infants, you should go for 40. If you have younger, older children, you should have 50. It's not a little backed up with a lot of data. In addition, there has been a, a recent article in 2021 that comes from Pittsburgh that looks on what threshold patients had and they survived actually and those ranges were much higher than what we actually practice and what people what the guidelines recommend so for below two years 45 was rated with better outcome for two to eight 57 and above eight 68 which is really high cerebral perfusion pressure however do we really have icp i've worked in several hospitals it's very hard to convince neurosurgeons to put an icp monitoring usually the brain is very swollen there is not a lot of uh, space, uh, ventricular space to put the ICP. Unless there is a bleeding and the surgeon, your surgeon is going to go anywhere to the R, they usually put, place it. So surveys from US and United Kingdom show that actually 60% only of the surgeons will agree with putting ICP. And uh, in the UK, only 60% patients of, uh, with severe traumatic brain injury will have ICP monitoring. So it's not common to have ICP. Whatever, if you don't have ICP, what we do, so we just come with a calculation based purely in mean blood pressure, and that comes from CHOP. Um, basically, we just target a certain mean blood pressure according to age, 
taking into consideration that the ICP is slightly going to be high. So those are the targets just to replace the CPP. What about non-invasive monitoring? So we've spoken about CT scan. So any patient with traumatic brain injury from emerge is going to have a CT scan. First of all, to look into any revert neurosurgical intervention that needs to be needed, a patient who has epidural, subdural, any bleed that can be drained, and look at the brain, how swollen it is. And when we say the brain is swollen, like this image, you see there's no sulci at all, the uh, peripheries. So the gyrion sulci is totally effaced. So the brain is totally swollen and the ventricles are very small. So if you have these findings, is it recommended to repeat CT scan again after six hours, 24 hours? Actually, it's not. So once you have the first CT that draws everything, it's not recommended to do a routine CT scan. So when do we do CT scans? Again, if you don't have an ICP and you have a change in your clinical exam. So the GCS drops more than two, change in the pupillary activity, or there is pupillary asymmetry, there is a new motor deficit, or you have a patient who you have a herniation syndrome, not ICP, high ICP. High ICP is basically tachycardia hypertension, but even beyond that, herniation is beyond that, when you have um, the pupils are dilated and reactive. That's really an emergency uh, to do imaging and to act upon it, actually. Other things that you have, electroencephalograph, so like a continuous EEG, and it has been found that 20% of patients with severe traumatic brain injury will have seizures, and unfortunately, 50% of those are being unconvulsive. So one out of 10 patients with severe traumatic brain injury is going to have seizures that we cannot see clinically. And unfortunately, some of those patients, their management is heavy sedation and paralysis, so they might be seizing underneath, and we cannot tell. And as you know, continuous EEG is not an easy thing. It's it's very heavy. It requires continuous monitoring. It requires a neurologist who's going to read the EEG for you continuously. That's not really available in most centers that I know. So what has been replaced with is quantitative EEG. So it looks into this the same EEG, but it compresses the data and it makes it easier to read for bedside critical care team. So this is one of the examples, and this is, comes from sick kids where you look into um, the qualitative, uh, quantitative EEG display. And basically the left upper is a normal EEG. So it, look, it compresses the EEG and it looks into the amplitude. So anywhere between above five to 25, that's a normal EEG. If you look into the third row from below, there is continuous and there is what we call burst. There's a burst suppression and a very low voltage when it's below five. That tells you that the patient has, it's not seizure, but severe background dysfunction. How do we see seizures? We see seizures as an upwards. So the activity of the brain is gonna increase and when it's compressed, it's just you look and it goes upwards, like the number two on the right. And status epilepticus, when those occur up to 30 minutes. So status definition is the same, it's 30 minutes and above. So if you continuously see those, the patient is in a, as, as in a status epilepticus. Another, this is what we've been shown. Another way to look into it is the, is the uh, intensity, color intensity, and it's almost the same principles. Another way that has been looked into to, to look into uh, intracranial pressure is the optic nerve sheath diameter. And that's used when centers don't have CT scan, for example, in the beginning or have limited resources, or you want to continuously monitor your patient with an ease. You don't need to move your patient. So what's uh, the optic nerve sheath diameter? Basically, the optic nerve sheath is what um, uh, covers the optic nerve. And there's CCF, so it's connected to the brain. And when there is high intracranial pressure, the CSF is going to accumulate and it's going to dilate. And this is uh, an MRI that shows you that, the dilation of the optic nerve sheath. So how do we see it with an ultrasound? So basically you apply a uh, tachyderm on the eye and then you have gel that you connect and with any probe. And as you see here, you can just look directly into the eye and you're going to see the eye. Then you can measure the optic sheath. So how to measure it? We measure from the outward wall and uh, there's different uh, measurements. So for adults, it's five millimeter. Beyond that, is the, it's, it's the, it's, it's the optic nerve sheath is, is, um, this is dilated, and that's reflection of high SAP. For an eight and children, it's four millimeter. So something that can be used at the bedside and replace the need of CT scans. So we kind of talked about high ICP monitoring um, and what if high ICP occurs. And as well, we talked about 
if it's changed in neurological exam, we take the patient on CT scan. What about if there is brain edema right now and it, we know the patient is very swollen? What can we do? So our goal is to prevent any triggers. So to how to do that? So we keep the patient really well sedated. However, if you have increase in the ICP momentarily and it's not related to pain, you feel the patient is comfortable, but the brain is just so swollen, it's not recommended to give those sedatives because they're gonna lower your blood pressure. And if you lower your blood pressure, you can, you're not gonna perfuse your brain. So only if we believe that the patient is agitated or is in pain, and that is the reason for the high intracranial pressure, we give sedation analgesia, which is fentanyl, midazolam, morphine, and midazolam. Otherwise, it's not recommended just to give them because that's gonna result in lower blood pressure. Anti-seizure prophylaxis, so is it recommended or is it not recommended? We went into phases with the guidelines, but the guidelines recommend right now to give seizure prophylaxis. Again, as I told you, one out of 10 patients, they can have subclinical seizures, so you cannot measure them. And even if seizure occurs, they're going to exacerbate the injury, so we want to prevent them. So usually the, the process is to give one of the anti epileptic drugs for at least one week prophylaxis. And if the patient starts disease, it's going to be extended. If the patient has no seizures and the outcome is fine, you don't need to prolong it more than one week. And that they could, the guidelines could not recommend phenytoin versus levetiracetam or Kepra. However, there has been several studies after that that looked retrospectively that showed uh, using phenytoin, actually, those patients had increased uh, odds of ratio of having seizures compared to Kepra, uh, compared to phenytoin. So I, I predict that in the coming future, Kepra is going to replace uh, phenytoin uh, as the prophylactic drug in traumatic brain injury, as it did already for status epileptic management. So Kepra is going to be the drug of choice in the future as drug that recommend using it. And the loading is anywhere between 20 to 60 milligram per kilo, and you continue add maintenance, as I mentioned, for one week. Ventilation strategy, what to do? So CO2 itself is a vasodilator. And if you vasodilate, there is going to be more blood going to the brain and more blood going to the brain. That's going to increase the intracranial pressure. So again, the brain is swollen. We don't want to allow anything to, to increase. We don't want more blood to go in there. So the treatment is to allow normal CO2, low normal CO2. It's not recommended to lower your CO2 below um, below 30, because what's gonna, that's going to do, that's going to actually cause constriction in the arteries going to the brain, and basically you're, you're, you're causing ischemia, so no blood is going to go to brain. We want some blood to go to the brain, we don't want a lot, but we want just enough blood to go to the brain. However, if a patient shows sudden increase in the ICP, it's one of the strategies that we do. So we do uh, acute, brief hyperventilation, just to cause vasoconstriction, decrease the intracranial pressure till we give our other medications. So as a maintenance, it's a low to normal CO2. If you have a crisis with high ICP or dilated pupils, of course, you have to back this patient rapidly and you're going to do hyperventilation to lower the ICP. So this kind of summarized, this diagram summarizes, and that's what we use, that the, the summarize the whole management of traumatic brain injury. So if you have an ICP or you don't have ICP, no ICP, you depend on your neuroworsening signs that I mentioned. If you have ICP, you don't want the ICP to be above 20 for five minutes or more. So what if that occurred? You have change in neurological exam or change in the ICP. So of course, the physician has to be at the bedside you have to adjust the head of the bed. So make sure that they're at least 30 degrees and that's to allow the blood to drain from the brain. So by gravity, the venous drainage occurs. You want the head to be in the midline. You want to remove any sequelae that might be causing compression. And if you feel that the patient is in pain, you have to give sedation analgesia. If you have an ICP, that's great. An EVD, basically, you can drain CSF. So you can allow the CSF to empty. So you open the EVD to allow to drain. And then you need to give your osmolar therapy, which we're going to cover. Manitol or 3%, as we mentioned, the brain is covered by blood-brain barrier that doesn't allow sodium and other osmols to move. So if you increase the osmolality in the blood, the fluid, the water is going to go from the brain to the blood, and that's going to lead to smaller brain size. And of course, you're going to hyperventilate. So what hyperosmolar therapy has been recommended? 3% is one of the drugs. Manitol is not mentioned, but it's one of the classical drug, the drugs that we use. There has been many uh, doses that has been recommended uh, for 3%, but the latest guidelines recommend 2 to 5. Previously, it was recommended up to 10 ml per kilo. 2 to 5, 
5 ml per kilo is going to increase almost your sodium by 4 ml, which is going to increase your multi by almost 8 to 10. So that's a good dose that has to be given. And usually if you have ICP, that's the dose they recommend. I believe 2 ml per kilo is going to increase your multi by only 4, which is not significant if you have a patient who's herniating who has a high ICP. So 5 ml per kilo, that has to be given as push. And another way of giving it, if you have a patient who's always having those high episodes, you can start an infusion anywhere between 0.1 ml, uh, 0.1 to 1 ml per kilo per hour. So 3% is going as an infusion. There hasn't been a lot of studies that compare 3% uh, uh, versus other drugs. This study looked uh, as a, just a prospective trial that looked not at outcomes, but how some of the drugs control the high intracranial pressure. So they compared fentanyl, 3%, Banitol and phenobarb, and they looked into the ICP and CPP in 16 children, almost 200 doses were given, and basically 3% was the fastest one, so it's associated with two-fold fast resolution of high ICP compared to fentanyl and phenobarb, so, and this, not an outcome study, but just looking into reducing the ICP faster, 3% seems to be superior. Manitol is another drug that we give that causes osmolality. The problem, manitol works in two ways. One of them is decreasing the viscosity of blood. So it allows blood to go smoother through the brain and leaving the brain faster. So that's actually how it works in the first kind of um, five to 15 minutes. And then the osmol osmolality effect takes after, which is after that, up to six hours. Uh, the issue with osmanitol, as you know, is, is diuretic. So if we're going to give it, we have to be careful with the urine output because we don't want the patient to be hypovolemic and having low blood pressure. So blood volume has to be replaced if the patient has is diuresing. So if we have to choose, if we have the luxury to choose between 3% or manitol, we're going to go with 3%. If manitol is the fastest and easily available, I'm going give, give to give manitol uh, to help. And hopefully soon, we're going to have some more insight on 3% benefits of manitol. This is a study that's going to come that actually Saudi Arabia was part of it, the hospital I work at. And actually, we looked into traumatic brain injury in Asia, Asia and in Latin America. Uh, it's more than like 30 ICUs uh, across the world. And we recruited 500 patients. We have already recruited everyone. We're just going to do the analysis to see the difference between 3% and manitol. Uh, hopefully, this study, it's, it's a perspective. It's not randomized. It just looks into practice. Hopefully, it's going to give us more insight which drug is superior. What if we gave you elevated the head, you hyperventilated, you give 3%, 5 ml per kilo, you even give manitol 0 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo, and the patient still shows worsening, it's not improving, or you have continuous of those episodes. What do we do? So we need to make sure that the CT is repeated. So there is no bleeding as, as the cause of this problem. Uh, we can give more 3% metal, but then we go into second tier therapy therapies. That is, there's not a lot of evidence by them, but we know physiologically that they work, which is either a barbiturate coma or moderate hypothermia. So temperature control, as you remember, the study that I we went through easy, uh, earlier, we're going to cover. It's a study that looked into hyperthermia on those patients. What the guidelines recommend, if you're going to cause, if you're going to use hypothermia as controlling for your traumatic brain injury, Basically, it's recommended to do it fast in the first six hours. However, if you're going to rewarm the patients, you have to do it very slowly. So if you're going to go to 33 degrees, you lower your temperature back again after the high ICP has been resolved after a few days by 0.5 to 1 degree every 12 hours. So that's very tight control and very slow control because rewarming has been thought to be one of the issues. And if phenytoin is used as an anti-seizure medication, we have to be very careful because it doesn't get metabolized. So we have to do levels. Uh, this is a study that looks into the hypothermia and traumatic brain injury. So uh, it, it cooled patients only for 24 hours. It started within eight hours and they looked into outcomes, both mortality and neurological outcomes, which is based on the pediatric cerebral performance category scale. So what, unfortunately, they did not show that actually there's no improvement in the outcome for the patients, the neurological outcome. Even in mortality, there was a trend toward more mortality in the hypothermic group. So patients who are cooled down to 33 degrees had more, had worse outcomes in terms of mortality. 
the ICP was not even different uh, significantly between the two groups. But what people, and this is just shows you that hypothermia had more mortality. What people criticize about this st study that they only called for one day. However, we know that the high ICP is gonna go beyond one day. So the ICP has not been resolved and we started rewarming them. What this study did that they rewarmed the patients faster. So we know with rewarming, they're gonna be reperfusion and that's why, um, uh, rewarming has been recommended to be slow. So this study, yes, it gave us some insight. However, it, it, it doesn't uh, tell us that hypothermia is not good. It just tells us that we don't use it. And maybe what we should do is controlling of the temperature. And if we forced to use the hypothermia, it has you have to warm the patients very slowly after that. Barbiturate, so high dose barbiturate for again, refractory uh, high ICP can be used barbiturate, it just puts the patients in a coma and a burst suppression. So it's going to lower the brain metabolism. And if you have lower metabolism, the brain does, is not going to swell as much. And we either use uh, phenobarb, it can be given in the doses higher than, so we do levels, but we don't care about the levels. We really need to go into burst suppression or infusions like pentobarbital, which is not available in Saudi Arabia, but thiopental is available and can be used as an infusion. Uh, the last thing that I, we, we have to mention, nutrition was in the first guidelines, it's disappeared from the second guidelines, then it came back. It's not a strong recommendation, but it's actually has been found. Early nutrition in retrospective trials is associated with better outcomes, with both mortality and neurological outcome. So those patients, as soon as they come to the ICU, they're intubated, we put an NG and we try to reach full feeds within 12, within, 12, within 24 hours. There is no reason to keep this patient in PO. Once you have it in AT tube and you're protecting the airway, you should go to full feeds unless there is a surgical reason for us not to feed the patient. So this kind of summarized the whole management of tra traumatic brain injury. You saw we spoke about ICP, CPP, uh, optic nerve sheath, CT scan, EEG, there's a lot of monitoring. So as we know, for kind of a, a septic shock management or hemodynamics management, we use our clinical exam, we looked at blood pressure, CVP, venous saturation, the oxygen tension, PO2, we look at glucose, lactate, we do ECG and echo. We don't have that yet in all traumatic brain injury patients. However, there is an equivalent for it for neuromonitoring. So our neurological exam, CPP, ICP, we, look in, we can look into saturation going to the brain. We can have a probes into the brain, tissue oxygenation. We can measure the brain glucose, the lactate of the brain. We can have EEG and transcranial Doppler and optic third. And I think at some point, that's where we're gonna be uh, in the future. However, now we stick with ICP, CPP. If we don't have ICP, we go with mean blood pressure, our neurological exam. They're still very valid. And at the end, Thomas Addison said the chief function of the body is to carry the brain around. And that's why this lecture is very important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for your excellent presentation, Dr. Yasser. Uh, I just have uh, for my side, just wait, I will see if the audience have, they have the priority. Uh, can we get the record? Oh, sure. <laughs> this is not uh, for you. All right, for you. I have, uh, if the child uh, received the manitol and started diuresis and you want to replace, how you will replace? You will replace after a fixed amount of urine and then you replace more or you will replace uh, what is stored the, uh, and fluid, the intervenous fluid or how you will replace? So there's different practices. There's nothing wrong, but what I would do if the urine output is more than four ml per kilo, I'm going to replace anything that's above that. Four ml per kilo, oh, I'm going to replace it for a few hours. Yeah. And if the blood pressure is compromised, I'm going to give even boluses. Afan, doctor? In units, we have replacing above five. So yes. in, in pediatric, four. Yeah, the target usually for a normal urine is one to four. So mm -hmm. that's where I, I come with this. It's a kind of personal practice. Anything that's only about four ml per kilo, I'm going to replace it. It's, it's, it's going to be a good amount. And if that was not enough to restore hemodynamics, I'm going to just give uh, boluses to restore a normal blood pressure. And what I think that I did not mention, if this with trauma, again, there might be change in hemodynamics, one of the depressors that's personal drug of choice is actually norepi, more than epinephrine. We don't want to increase the load on the heart. We just vasoconstrict to, to increase your cerebral perfusion pressure. Good. And you will uh, you will calculate and replace every six hours or per shift no, or 
no, I'm gonna initially, if the patient's they're sick a lot hourly, then we we can re relax after that. But the for the first few hours after manitol is like hourly. Hourly. Okay. okay. Time. Another thing uh, we we told that uh, you told that we will uh, uh, start uh, anticonvulsive prophylaxis yes, for about sir. one week. Yes. Sir. Right. Uh, now, suppose that the baby has non-convulsive in the start, as we told, then we started the, uh, the prophylaxis, and mm -hmm. we don't know. Before st stopping, should we re-evaluate with EEG or something to, to be sure that this baby was not in non-convulsive status or anything, or we will just abruptly stop after one week in spite the drug has built up a level and maybe uh, we'll go to seizures again after if I stop abruptly. If the, if the patient um, had a good neurological outcome and you were able to extubate and has a good exam, uh, I will stop it. If the patient still has kind of a, at, at the one we mark is, is still not doing well, of course, I'm going to do an EEG. I'm not going to stop it because they might have non-convulsive seizures. So yes. EEG is one of the tools that I'm going to use. Good. I have another question from Dr. Yasser. Uh, does decompressive cranial to be has a role? Uh, what's the outcome? Um, so th there's there has been a lot of studies looking into that, even in, in Saudi Arabia, including multi-center trials for adult patients. Uh, in the guidelines, it's it's still mentioned there that it's decompressive cranial to fracture ICP. However, when you look into the adult studies, they shifted patients with who the mortality decreased. However, they had more vegetative patients in the decompressive craniectomy. So out of personal experience, if we're going to shift patients from dying to, to be vegetative and just surviving with vegetative, zero quality of life, uh, I personally, I do not go with decompressive craniectomy to control high ICP. If the patient has a bleed that the neurosurgeons need to drain and the neurosurgeon in the OR elects to do craniectomy for that bleed, um, that's something that we do. However, solely for controlling high ICP, refractor ICP, I don't believe that the compressive craniectomy has a role. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yasser, for this. Uh, it was a heavy presentation. Uh, I thank you so much for being with us. Uh, hope, inshallah, to see you in the next uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. Okay, now we will continue with uh, the next speaker. Our next speaker will be Dr. Anada Al Qadi. Uh, Dr. Anada Al Qadi is a consultant physio pediatric physiotherapy and she is the chairman of the uh, neonatal uh, physiotherapy team. Uh, also, she is the chairman of the swallow training team in our NICU. She is uh, she's working with us in uh, Saudi German Hospital uh, in Riyadh. Uh, she will give us uh, a comprehensive overview uh, over the rehabilitation for patients with CP. Okay, Dr. Anada, you can share your presentation and start. I would like to express my appreciation to our eminent Dr. Nabil Shahata, the most senior doctor in our organization for, for his great effort to organize such a successful symposium, and also grateful thanks for Dr. Samira and Dr. Rami, our concern. Uh, physical therapy has a great role in all pediatric cases at different ages, but my talk will be specific today on the rehabilitation for cerebral palsy. Outlines for the lecture, what is the cerebral palsy? Classification of cerebral palsy, difference between spasticity and contractures, uh, physical problems of CB, what is the benefit from physical therapy to uh, CB? Uh, some approaches used in, in physical treatment of CB. First, what is the cerebral palsy? Cerebral palsy is neurodevelopmental impairment caused by non-progressive lesion in single or multiple location in immature people. The lesion leads to persistent disorders of movement and butcher of bearing in early in the infant's life. It's not a specific disease, but a problem of group neurological disorders of right causes.
uh, they are as, uh, usually associated with disabilities as well as emotional, social, family difficulties. The range of severity may be from total immobility and total family dependence, although he can perform some clumsy action. In the past, uh, many children with cerebral palsy were not survived, but with the improvement medical care, we can uh, see a lot of them are surviving nowadays. Uh, risk factor for cerebral palsy, prenatal or prenatal. In prenatal causes prolonged and difficult labor, premature rupture of membranes, presentation anominal vaginal bleeding at, labor at time of labor, bradycardia and hypoxia postnatal, CNS infections like uh, encephalitis or meningitis, head trauma or seizures. In prenatal causes prematurity less than 36 weeks, low birth weight less than 2.5 kg, uh, maternal epilepsy infections leading in the third trimester, severe toxemia, eclampsia, Pre, uh, placental insufficiency and drug abuse and trauma. The majority of cerebral palsy cases are so to happen before a birth or prenatal, which typically means the underlying causes is really hard to pin down. Exposure to radiation and infection uh, during fetal development can cause cerebral palsy. Doesn't the getting enough oxygen can also have problems like uh, placenta, placenta not being able to supply uh, enough oxygen and nutrition. Cerebral palsy doesn't have to happen prenatal only, but sometimes occur postnatal, like a trauma or again infection or, uh, or period of oxygen deprivation. Types of CV, we have two types of CV, congenital and acquired. The congenital result when the insult of the developing brain occurs before, during the birth process. 85% occurs during the critical period. The acquired cerebral palsy, 15 of this case can occur during the first two years of his life, while the brain of the child is still developed. Classification of cerebral palsy. We have four, we classify the cerebral palsy according to four, type, four, uh, four, type, four categories for uh, uh, classification. Number one, quality of muscle tone. Number two, pattern of movement. Number three, the most commonly aspect classification of CB uh, based on clinical sign. Number four, the degree of severity. Number one, the muscle tone. Uh, what is the muscle tone? Uh, is the resistance of the muscle, uh, of the muscle to passive stretch or elongation? Basically, the amount of tension a muscle at rest. Normal tone uh, is high enough to resist the effect of gravity, impose posture and environment and movement, yet, yellow, uh, yet low enough allow to freedom of movement. And hypertonia is the resistance of passive movement. It's not depending on velocity, can be with or without spasticity. What is the spasticity? Spasticity is an increase in, is in the resistance to sudden passive movement and is velocity dependent. The faster the passive movement, the stronger the resistance. Spasticity is considered to be a form of sustained efferent musculature hyperactivity, dependent on the continuous supraspinal drive to the alpha motor neuron. The muscle tone is dynamic and can be influenced by the body position and hip position. If emotional factors like anger, systemic factors as illness, or fatigue, uh, if, uh, environmental factors like uh, temperature and behavior factors, including the effort. Spasticity is characterized by increased muscle tone hyperactivity, reflexes, and possible clonus or rigidity. The increase of muscle tone may, may result in the loss of joint motion, leading to contractures. Treatment of established contractures is very difficult. Prevention of contractures by joint mobilization is based on the goal in the management of patients with spasticity. The contracture deformity, what is the difference between a contracture deformity and spasticity? A contracture is developed when the normal stretchy elastic tissue replaced by non-stretchy elastic tissue fiber-like tissue. The tissue makes it hard to stretch the area and prevent the normal movement. Contracture is mostly like in the skin, the tissue, uh, and the muscles, tendons, and ligaments surrounding the joint. The effect, they affect the range of motion and function and in a certain body part, often there is also pain, cause the pain. This is modified actual scale. This is a scale which we use to measure the spasticity. We have five um, uh, we have five grades for measuring the spasticity from zero to four, which is uh, zero is no increase in tone, which is uh, the muscle is normal. Number one, uh, grade one, slight increase in tone, catch and release at end of range of motion. One plus. Slight increase in tone, catch and release, and the resistance through the rest to a half of range of motion. A great two marked increase in the tone through the range of motion, but affected parts moving, moved easily. Number three, a great three, considerable increase in tone, passive movement will be difficult. Number four, 
uh, or grade four affected parts in rigid flexion and extension. Uh, there is a difference between how to measure spasticity and how to measure muscle power. The muscle strength, we, uh, we use to evaluate uh, muscle power, we use to evaluate the muscle strength can be effective in different weakness from the imbalances or poor endurance. We have, we have also five grades for measuring the muscle uh, power or muscle strength from zero to normal. Zero, no muscle or no contraction in muscle skin. Uh, grade one, trace, the flicker or uh, contraction is thin. Uh, grade two, poor active movement only with gravity elimination. Uh, grade three, fair active movement against the gravity with no resistance. Grade four, uh, good uh, 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 active movement against the gravity with some resistance. Number five, and normal, this is a normal muscle, activity uh, full range of motion against the gravity with full resistance. The second uh, category for classification is uh, pattern of movement. We have four. If you have, we have five. Uh, we have four, uh, five. <laughs> we have five categories for pattern of movement. Category number one is basic type, including hemiplegia and diplegia, quadriplegia. It's about 70, 70 percent of the cases. This kinetic type from cerebral palsy include the acetoids, dystonia, chorea. Number three, ataxia. Number four, hypotonic. Uh, number five, mixed type. Uh, the third uh, category for classification, classification due to the clinical sign. Uh, we, we classify the clinical sign with hypotonia, hypertonia, acetone. The characteristic of hypotonia, the baby is low tone, the hypertonia uh, is high tone, the acetoid fluctuated tone. The distribution range of, motion, of movement, the hypotonia becomes generalized symmetrical excessive to movement, the hypertonia becomes generalized often uh, unsymmetrical, also the acetoid uh, generalized and asymmetrical. The deep reflexes or tendons, في uh, الهايبوتونيا بيكون ويك في الهايبرتونيا strong في الاسيتويد also strong the integration of primitive reflexes في الهايبوتونيا weak weak في الهايبرتونيا often delayed integration في ال في الاسيتويد also delayed the achievement of motor milestones في both في ال في ال three categories is delayed في الوانس اوف بادي بوزيشن الهايبوتونيا از از ريمايند ذا سيم دنت افكتد باي ذا بادي بوزيشن في الهايبرتونيا والاسيتويد افكتد باي ذا بوزيشن الكونسيستي اوف اوف ذا ماسل في الهايبوتونيا سوفت في الهاي في الهايبرتونيا بتكون هارد في الاسيتويد بتكون اليستيك السبريت بي بروبلمز في الهايبوتونيا بتكون شالو في الهايبرتونيا ديكريز ثراسيك موبيليتي في الاسيتويد ديكريز اولسو ثراسيك موبيليتي Speech problems for hypotonia, shallow breathing, for hypertonia, dysarthria, for acetoid, also dysarthria. The feeding problems for hypotonia, we can weak gagging reflex, for hypertonia, or acetoid, we can abnormally strong gagging reflex. Uh, classification, the fourth uh, category for classification according to the severity. Number one, transitory motor problems may occur and resolve it without permanent effect. Category number two, severe, severe cases can be diagnosed before six months of the age. Number three, moderate cases are usually diagnosed by one, by one year, while the cases can be diagnosed by the time when the child starts to walk. There are many, three many aspects for classification CV. Retardation, the involved, the, uh, retardation in the development of new skills except the chronological uh, age, uh, resistance of the infantile behavior in all functions, uh, performance of various, fun various functions in pattern never seen in normal babies. This is also because upper motor neuron lesion and biomechanical uh, dif difficulties from, from fronting the CB children. The general motor disorders in CB include number one, disorders of postural fixation, inability to maintain the head or trunk erect in most important and voice effect in all cerebral cases except the mildest case of hemiplegia. Number two, failure of suppression of primitive reflexes in both brain stem and delayed or delayed in the developmental of, uh, of uh, postural reactions. Resistance of primitive reflexes like grasping, more or rooting. Resistance of brain stem uh, reflexes like tonic labyrinthine and, neck, neck, and uh, tonic neck reflexes. Disorders of muscle tone can be diminished abnormal state hypotonia or increased hypertonia or fluctuated tone. Paralysis and disorders of pattern of involuntary movement, involve involuntary movement like acetoid or chorea. Failure of uh, development of cortical reactions, postural reactions. Right. physical problems for, uh, for uh, CB, uh, 
the most the most common four types for CVs, basicity. Number one is basicity, the most common physical problem of them, yani. Low tone in, uh, in trunk musculature, sometimes hyperactivity seen in cases. It's basicity in extremity musculature, the degree of it varied according to the children, condi the general condition, emotional state, temperature, and health. It's also dependent on the correct position and the degree of support to the children. Severe degree of co contraction uh, of and parts, especially around the uh, proximal joint. Maintain, maintaining extremities in mild, in mild range, stereotyping pattern of movement and lack of isolated or discreted movement and fine coordination, motor coordination. Slope movement associated reaction present, incomplete development of postural reaction. Some muscle appears weak due to reciprocal inhibition by spastic antagonists like uh, dorsiflexors of the trunk by uh, spastic triceps shoulders. True weakness may be developed in some muscle from long dis uh, standing disuse, fearful of movement. At risk of orthopedic, At risk for orthopedic uh, problems, the secondary to muscle and joint tightness, flexion deformity at hip uh, and knee equinus at ankle. Skeletal deformity may be developed due to imbalance of muscle activity, lack of active mo functional movement, prolonged position with muscle head, muscle with muscle held at the length, and their effect on growth. Uh, physical problems of the child with this kinetic type. Implantary movement may be slower fast. Lactuating level of the muscle tone started with early hypotonia, then become hypertonia. Muscle spasm, sudden flexion or extension, lack of co contraction of muscles and trunk of muscle girth. Uh, inability to hold segment at various points uh, within the range of the motion. In uh, impairment of postural fixation of the head and trunk. Asymmetric in both postural and movement. Head, trunk, and upper extremity usually move the involved than lower extremity. The movement of the head affects the trunk and lips lack of postural control. Incomplete development of postural reactions. The dyskinetic type changes with the time. They may be floppy in the babyhood and, and only exhibit the involved involuntary movement when they reaching two years of age. Problems may be present. Acetoid, acetoid may find difficult to look upward. Speech difficult and breathing. Uh, paralysis of gazing movement in, uh, may be occur. So the acetoid may find it difficult to upward and sometimes to close their eyes through Poor head control disturbs the use of eye. Physical problems of the child with ataxia. Uh, usually hypotonic is uh, hypotonic. There is excessive flexibility of joints and poor muscle power, but sometimes have increased tone. Uh, poor contraction, co contraction, and sustained holding of posture. In coordination, clumsy movement, dysmetria, posture reactions are poorly uh, controlled, uh, difficult to be balanced and, uh, and uh, difficult balance and stretching gait, nystagmus. Physical problems with the child with hypotonia, ex ex Extend excessive hypotonia for all the body. It may be resist, but is often transition within two years. Sometimes we will be re reclassified again with spastic or acetoid ataxia or ataxia. Loss of head control and and trunk uh, and kicking movement. Very poor trunk stability and control. Uh, joint hypermobility, absent of postural reactions. Developmental delay. The child may have respiratory problems. This phage and drooling are common frog position. This uh, the gait disorders in spastic <coughs> cerebral palsy differ according to the involvement. We have three types for getting. Number one, uh, crouch gait. As you see in the video, the bilateral impairment typically by excessive hip flexion and extension, plantar flexion, uh, flexion and uh, anterior pelvic tail. A second type is plastic genial recurvatum is the opposite clinical picture of crouch gait. The knee moves into hyperextension during stance, and the ankle has excessive plantar flexion. The heavy still may have resistant flexion as the patient leans forward to balance over the plantar flexion foot.
The third gate is the hemiplegic gate. It's characterized by asymmetrical, described step length and stride in the involved side, poor pelvic and shoulder girdle rotation side, with retraction on the involved side and absence of heel strike in the involved side. Implantry movement occur with TB. Uh, we have four uh, implantry movement. Number one, dystonia. It means slow rotational movement in the torso of the torso, arm, or leg. Korea. It means sudden implantry movement, especially in the fingers and toes. Acetoid is writing movement mainly in the fingers and faces. Korea acetoid is a combination between Korea and acetoid. This kinesia. It means a general term used to describe the implantry movement. Like situated neurological problems with TB. Number one, vision problems, mental uh, retardation, communication disorder, dysphagia, drooling, epilepsy, or uh, seizure, gross problems, abnormal sensation and perception, emotional and behavioral disturbance, bladder and bowel problems, oromotor dysfunction, and respiratory dysfunction. The factors affecting the uh, prognosis of the CB. Uh, number one, clinical type of CB and its severity. Number two, the degree of delayed milestone present at the evaluation. Number three, the pathological reflexes present. Number four, the degree of associated effect in intelligence, sensation, and emotional adjustment. Number five, early treatment or intervention to minimize developing problems. The, the intervention for treating the CB doing by a multidisciplinary team consisted of a pediatrician, neurologist, physiotherapist, or orthopedic surgeon, speech therapist, ophthalmologist, a psychologist. Uh, orthopedic uh, surgical intervention of CB. The goal, the, the goal for orthopedic uh, surgery depended on depending on the potential. If the baby walking have walking uh, has walking potential, the goal is functional amputation. The operative operate operate to achieve the good hip and knee extension, stable hips. Blunt, blunt grading stable feet. If the baby has to no walking potential, the goals become sitting balance. Operative to, to, uh, to achieve straight spine, horizontal pelvis, stable pelvis. The, uh, the ortho uh, surgeries in the CB, according to type of CB. If the baby is quadriplegic uh, CB, the surgical procedure most common performed is hip adductor flexor release or osteotomy supine fusion. If the baby is diabetic, uh, the surgical procedure did for him, hamstring, gastrocnemia, slinting, hip adductor, hip adductor flexor lensing, uh, duration of the osteotomy, rectus femoris transfer. If the baby is hemiplegic, uh, the surgical procedure is gastrocnemia, slinting, split tibialis anterior and posterior transfer, tibialis posterior, posterior lensing. The rehabilitation, what is the name yeah, meaning of rehabilitation as a word? Rehabilitation is name given to all diagnostic and therapeutic procedures which aim to develop the maximum, uh, maximum the, the physical and social and vocational function desired of the person. The goals between improve the mobility, prevent the deformity, educate the parents, teach daily living skills, social integration. The physical therapy intervention be, uh, become if you have primary impairment due to brain lesion or secondary impairment. The primary impairment, the muscle tones, spasticity or dystonia, the balance, the strength, uh, selective sensation, coordination, flexibility, endurance, management, posture gait. All these items uh, is primary impairment, which is a, is a physical therapy with Chola uh, treated. The secondary impairment like uh, contractures, fill adductors, deformities like scoliosis, adaptive mechanism, knee hyperextension in the stance. Like how does the physical therapy can help the uh, CB children? The, the physical therapy is often the first step for treating the cerebral palsy. It can help and improve motor skills and can prevent the movement problems from get worse and most the time. The, the physical therapy Implant the strength and flexibility by exercise, heat, heat treatment, massage, and special equipment to give the children with cerebral palsy more independence and decrease the suffering of the family. 
the extent to which to help the physical therapy depends on the severity and the type of each cases of cerebral palsy. Children with milder case of CV may only uh, require some physical therapy to treat their condition. In more, severe, in more severe cases, it may be used alongside treatment or medication. Being a physical therapy as early as possible usually gives the children best chance to be enrolled. Uh, the type of the exercise vary and have a specific benefit uh, of cerebral palsy. Some of the benefits may be um, uh, some of the benefits of cerebral palsy. If the baby is spastic, the physical therapy can reduce the muscle tension and jerky movement associated with the cerebral palsy. The exercise can stretch and can give and relieve stiffness over the time. If the baby is acetoid, the people with acetoid cerebral palsy use the physical therapy to increase the muscle tone and gaining more control over their movement. If the baby is ataxic, the physical therapy can improve the balance problems uh, facing uh, feeding him. The physical therapy can also uh, treat a range of other issue experienced by the, the CB like scoliosis, cirrhosis kyphosis, pelvic inclination, pelvic rotation, knee deformities, shortening of tendo achilles, hand and wrist deformities. The physical therapy using techniques such as soft tissue mobilization, joint mobilization, specialized exercise, stretching, endurance exercise, designing to meet their therapeutic goals. The equipment we use, uh, we can use mobile, mobile, mobility aids that like racing, spider cage, crashing, uh, standards, casting, splinting, shoes, uh, canes, walkers. The advantage of this mobility aids, uh, to, uh, is to uh, develop a balance, decrease the energy expenditure, uh, improve the posture, decrease the load in the joint. This is some of the equipment we use in uh, physical therapy. Uh, we use the goals of the pressing to increase the function, prevent the deformity, keep the joint in a functional position, st stabilize the trunk and extremities, facilitate the selective motor control, decrease the spasticity, protect the extremity from injury in the post-operative phases. In braces by LCB, we use uh, ankle foot or sources, knee ankle foot or sources, hip abductor or sources, surasu lumbar sacral or sources, supra medullar orthosis, foot orthosis, hand splint. Uh, what is the function of a foot or ankle foot orthosis? The main function for it to keep the foot in, uh, in a plantar grade position. For the step phase, we to use to stable the press for support. For the swing phase, prevent the drop foot. But at night, we use it to prevent the contractures. The function of spinal braces to slow the progression of deformity, to delay surgery, to allow the skeletal growth, to assist the sitting balance, to protect the surgical site from excessive loading after surgery. This is a spider cage. Spider cage we used uh, with cerebral palsy baby. It allows the service to assist an individual exercise and activities in various positions that optimize the motor learning and neuroplasticity. This is some approaches we use to uh, the physical therapy. Uh, the most common approaches we use uh, POPAS technique or neurodevelopmental technique, sensory, sensory motor learning, no, not movement itself. The aim of this uh, treatment may be summarized as the following. Inhibit abnormal reflexes activity and facilitate normal posture reaction. Number two, guide the child through the normal sequence of motor development. Number three, normal the integration of both sides of the body is facilitated while associated reactions is, are avoided. Number four, normal response once elected are, are always repeated. Number five, voluntary control of normal responses is encouraged. encouraged. Uh, the second the approach we use, the VOITA method of the therapy. We have 18 points in the body crowning reflexes rolling, placing the child in particular position and stimulation of the key position, a point uh, in the body would enhance the CNS development. In this way, the child is supposed to learn normal movement better in a place of abnormal motion. 
applied by the primary creative at home at least four to five times daily and stop after one year if there is no improvement. Uh, it used are it are used to reduce spasticity and sometimes to facilitate the motor normal posture and movement reaction. Uh, the third technique we use the neurofacilitatory technique. Sensory input to the CNS produce uh, reflex motor output. Various neurofacilitation techniques are based on this, uh, this, this basic principles. All of these techniques are aimed to normalize the muscle tone, to establish advanced posture reactions, and to facilitate the normal movement pattern. This is the clinical case. Uh, this baby was uh, uh, trans uh, transferred to our hospital. Uh, this baby was a case of uh, CB, spastic quadriplegic CB, post meningitis encephalitis. It was uh, when she admitted Yanni, she was, it was RDS on MV and steroid. According to the history of the parents, this baby doesn't move at all, especially left side. As seen in the video, the baby start to make rolling with the left side. The baby starts to raise his left arm to catch the, his button. The baby can uh, make a good hand control from a uh, prone position and he can hold his head. Now the baby can sitting with a sister with goes with an acceptable head control. Then the baby can sit with minimal assistance as you see. Someone he need more uh, journey for uh, physical therapy, but it's good improvement in short time. Because early intervention for uh, this babies early will get again will get more improvement uh, than starting this. Uh, this is what my catch. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We don't have a chance, so we will proceed to our next speaker. Our next speaker, you can stop sharing. Our next speaker will be Dr. Abdullah Al-Fifi. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Al-Fifi is a consultant pediatrician and his consultant subspeciality uh, genetics and uh, metabolic diseases in Security Force Hospital in Riyadh. Uh, Dr. Abdullah is a member of the Saudi uh, Society for Genetic uh, Diseases uh, and he is uh, a member in the Saudi Council uh, Dr. Abdullah will speak to us uh, or give us an idea about an approach to a dysmorphic child. Welcome, Dr. Abdullah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nabil. Thank you for organizing committee. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Abdullah, I will talk today about approaching a child with uh, dysmorphic features. Uh, and uh, the dysmorphology is a study of abnormal uh, abnormalities of body structure that origin originate before birth. The mechanisms that cause this abnormality also. Dysmorphic means abnormal appearing. So uh, the term of dysmorphic is used to describe the children whose physical features, particularly features that are not usually found in a child of the same age or ethnic background. Some features are abnormal in all circumstances. Example, premature fusion of the cranial suture, these are called good 
diagnostic handles, as they are not found as normal or familial traits. In contrast to second, third toy syndactyly or epicanthic faults, which may be low diagnostic handles. So uh, as usual, diagnostic approach for dysmorphia or anything else, we start by history and physical examination. Then we have to go for synthesis and uh, specific investigations for this dysmorphia and genetic counseling and perinatal diagnosis and late uh, last uh, follow-up. <clears throat> genetic oriented history, uh, pregnancy and, uh, sorry, uh, uh, pregnancy, birth, maternal illness, before and during pregnancy, medications, uh, is there any infections, uh, possible teratogenic exposures, uh, preconception folic acid, diagnostic procedures, uh, ultrasound or aminosynthesis, any of this uh, done for this baby antenatally. Uh, also, perinatal, we have to concentrate on gestational age, mode of delivery, fatal presentation, the complications of labor, growth parameter, and neonatal status, uh, vagal, breathing, and seizures. Also, we uh, check the genetic oriented uh, background uh, by checking the physical growth of the child, uh, height, weight, his circumference, newborn course, feeding, obvious anomalies, uh, complications and uh, if the baby need resuscitation or not. Also, we'll check the developmental progression of the patient, of, of the baby, early milestones, and also we'll check formal psychometric testing and uh, general health of this baby, illness, operations, special studies, respiratory problems, feeding problems, seizures, any difficulties with vision or hearing, uh, developmental and behavioral phenotype. Uh, from a family degree, which is important to check a three generation in the family history, parental ages and health status, consanguinity, multiple miscarriages and birth defects or other genetic disease. Uh, also, we have to draw with a degree, uh, as I said, three generation is required to be constructed, which means child, parents, and grandparents, and the related uncles, aunts, and the cousin. Main line on the left or the right, if you wish, but be consistent. Roman numerals are used for the defining generation. Arabic numerals are used to indicate each individual within a generation. Here is an example for a pedigree drawing. As we see here, the male side and the left side and uh, female in the other side, also three generation and here the numerical uh, numbers. Uh, also, uh, we have to go for physical examination and uh, the dysmorphic child and look for the uh, general look and do our measurements for the weight and the circumference and uh, for the length, also to do head to toe examination. Uh, physical examination is of extreme importance and requires skills and eagle eye to pick up any abnormalities. One should use well-defined and uncommon handles for search. Examination of other family members, siblings, and parents may be crucial to determining whether any dysmorphic features noted are familial or uh, syndromic. Here's some picture for uh, some uh, syndromic and uh, dysmorphic uh, uh, signs. Okay, synthesis is uh, by synthesis, major rare anomalies, pattern recognition, personal experience, uh, literature review, software research, and online research. Those things are we needed to uh, synthesize our uh, history and examination for a patient then we uh, try to put him under which a category of uh, dysmorphia. Also, we have to go for special investigation like uh, chromosomal analysis, uh, fish analysis should be done also, a re-CGH, specific molecular test for single gene defect at DNA level also. Uh, in, in cases of neurometabolic or storage disease, we will go for enzyme assay 
Uh, we need to do neuroimaging for a dysmorphic child to check the brain uh, malformation and uh, skeletal survey is important and depend on the disorders being investigated. Also skin and muscle biopsy should be considered by also mutation analysis and full gene study. Le uh, lastly, we will go for whole exome sequencing and check all the genes for any uh, mutation or variants that can lead us to the uh, diagnosing of this dysmorphic child. Uh, growth, uh, taking the child's weight, length, his circumference, assess whether the baby growth parameters are in proportion as well as the percentiles. Also obtain the birth weight if possible. General look, the general look to the child, it may give a direct spot of diagnosis or give a clue for possible diagnosis, like in those pictures. And also skulls, we have to look for the skull by inspecting should be done directly overhead, as well as from front and side to permit detection of even minor degree of asymmetry. <coughs> Uh, palpation, especially in young infants, when patency and the relationship of sutures and fontanels can be uh, ascertained. Uh, detect patency of anterior and posterior fontanel. Detect width anterior usually one to five centimeter, posterior complete closure to one centimeter. Palpate sutures for the same. If sutures remain wide beyond first month of age, pathological cause need to be uh, rolled out. Frontal bossing uh, in the skull, uh, like in scaphocephaly, fusion of sagittal suture with elongation of the skull in AP axis, uh, brachycephaly, broadening of the skull with decrease of AP axis due to bilateral coronal sinostosis, brachycephaly, uh, unilateral coronal fusion, a trigon kephali is a triangular head and pole-like forehead due to stenosis of metopic. Uh, here, the, some uh, abnormality in the skull, uh, like in brachycephaly, toricocephaly, and plagiocephaly, uh, metopic ridge, uh, scaphocephaly in this picture, and uh, uh, this is regarding the skull inspection and palpation and abnormalities. Here the face, a lot of things we have to check in the face, gain overall impression of facial appearance. Sometimes overall can be diagnostic like in Down syndrome. If no diagnosis is made, it is uh, then important to divide the face into sections to examine it thoroughly. You may divide the face into the forehead and mid face and uh, oral region and to check uh, intrapupillary distance, inner canthal distance, outer canthal, uh, filetral length, uh, upper and lower lip, filetrum and jaw size and shape. So we have the uh, example for abnormality like in the flat face, uh, usually seen with myopathic disease, uh, broad face in some black families, narrow face in inner east, in near east, sorry, uh, benched face when small facial features are clustered close together, uh, prematurely aged face, the face looks older than the chronological age. Facial asymmetry usually caused by prolonged direct pressure in uterus can be resolved in first uh, Month of life, potter face, it's uh, been presented in oligohydramenius. Coarse facial features like in storage disease, triangular face, example in silver syndrome, hypoblastic mid face due to inadequate growth of central uh, maxilla. Uh, eyes also, we have to look for the eyes uh, closely, check off for. Uh, uh, strabismus, corneal clouding, cataract, glaucoma, red reflex, blue sclera, heterochromia, uh, brush field spots, microphthalmia, ocular coloboma, uh, eye space uh, by checking the canthal distance and palpebral fissure shape and uh, palpebral fissure length. Uh, outer canthal distance and inner canthal distance interbubular distance also. Uh, eyes, uh, also we have the distance, it can give us hypertolerism, like increase in the intrabubular distance, 
Hypotelism is decreased intra interpupillary distance. We have synorphy, which is fusion of eyebrows, spares lashes, not thick or dense, short lashes, uh, protruding eyes like in hyperthyroidism, shallow orbits like a Crozen or Apert syndrome. Here, uh, picture for down slanting eyes. Here, the up slanting eyes also picture like in Down syndrome. Uh, here, we have the picture for iris coloboma. Um, this patient having uh, hypertolerism. And here, the opposite, which is hypotolerism in this picture. Uh, here, the synorphy, which is uh, can be seen like in Cornelia de Lange syndrome. And here the iris lash nodules, which you can be seen in the eyes uh, by, and also need ophthalmology or sometimes to check uh, closely. And uh, here mid face region uh, in the nose, we divide the nose into three sections from the lateral view from superior to inferior. We have the nasal root, bridge, nostrils, patency position, antiverted nostrils often, uh, often reflect a short nose. So uh, we check the nose from each side. Uh, here we have a picture for hypoplastic nostrils. Uh, here the tubular nose and uh, flat nasal bridge here also we can see. Uh, ears also we have to check the ears for the position, for the formation, and also for the hearing and for the uh, lining with the eye uh, here, low set ear, such in like in Down syndrome, we see this uh, condition. And here is skin tag. We have to check uh, the tags and uh, check the uh, the patient later on for renal any any renal anomalies. Uh, here microtia, which can give us uh, uh, signs for some syndromes. Uh, also here, posterior rotated ears in this picture, we uh, can give us hint for some uh, disease or syndromes. Uh, also mouth, we have to check the mouth for philtrum and for upper and lower lips and uh, check the length and check the uh, dentation. Uh, what to look for? Look for microstomia, small mouth or a large mouth or long philtrum and short philtrum, smooth philtrum, dentation, cleft, uh, either in uvula or soft and hard palate or lips. Uh, check the large tongue, microglossia or microglossia, and also look for gingival hyperplasia, with, with, which may indicate a storage disease. Here's a picture for a patient or the long philtrum. Uh, and here for patient with a split uvula and this baby with the cleft lip also, it's obvious. And here this baby with macroglossia and uh, also just we have to examine it and by inspection and by looking for any abnormalities in the, uh, uh, in the chest like pictus carinatum, pictus excavatum and chill chest. Uh, all these abnormalities can lead us to a uh, diagnosis uh, with other uh, anomalies. So back examination, what to look for? Look for short trunk, sacral dimple, winged scapula, uh, thoracolumbar scoliosis, and spina uh, bifida. Here, these pictures, it give us uh, uh, like here, scoliosis, and we can see here the winged scapula. Uh, also, we go to hands and feet and examine for any abnormalities or congenital anomalies, like in arachnodactyly, fingers are long, slender, and curved. A brachydactyly, shortening of the fingers. Combatodactyly, congenital digital flexion, deformity. Polydactyly can be pre or post axial. Syndactyly fusion of fingers or phalanges, simian creases and uh, single can be normal within a population, but still it's a sign for some syndromes. Um, radial ray defects uh, and uh, uh, this defect or absence in the radius or thumb, it can give us. Uh, 
some uh, example for some syndromes. Uh, here, this pictures for uh, brachydactyly and uh, syndactyly, uh, clinodactyly, preaxial, polydactyly, and uh, postaxial, polydactyly. This uh, some abnormalities in the hands. We can see it, obvious. And uh, this is my uh, end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if there is any questions, welcome. Dr. Nabil. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for your nice picture. Yeah, Dr. Samira, welcome, welcome. After all of this, we have also always uh, to synthesize our uh, uh, history and examination and search because a lot of uh, anomalies and a lot of syndromes in the literature. Yes. Thank you again for all the audience also. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, thank you for, for your participation with us. I think there is no questions for you. Uh, we'll shift over Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, are you here? Rabtali, you can stop sharing, please. Dr. Abdullah. Yeah. Stop sharing, please, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Ali Abdul Nasser. He's a consultant pediatric intensivist. He's the chairman of the BICU in King Khalid University Hospital. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ab uh, Dr. Ali. He will speak, uh, will uh, uh, give to us uh, two presentations. The first one will be pulmonary hypertension in children, and the second one will be multiple system inflammatory syndrome. We'll start with pulmonary hypertension in children. Dr. 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 Ali. Uh, just to we'll wait for a uh, few minutes, Dr. Ali has a problem, but he is there. Uh, he will just connect after five minutes or something. Sorry for this.
Uh, we are sorry for this. Uh, Dr. Ali is خلاص fixing his problem. Uh, he told us in two minutes he will join, inshallah. Sorry for this. السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته حيا الله منجا الصوت والله ما واضح يا دكتور نبيل ليه أنا سامعك كويس سمعني افتح الكاميرا بتاعتك وشوف يكون أنت عامل ميوت أو موطي الصوت عندك دقيقة بس بحاول اسوي شيرنج ما انا قادر ادخل مع الشيرنج ثواني بس افتح البرزنتيشن لوحده وبعدين اعمل شير كيف؟ افتح البرزنتيشن الاول وبعدين اعمل منه ش... اعمل شير عليه والكام بتاعك مش مفتوح برضه يعني كده عشان شريك اللي هو مش مفتوح ايش؟ الكاميرا الكاميرا اوكي بفتحها ما يخالف لكن ويفتح البرزنتيشن واعمل له شير انا ابغى ادخل على الـ الـ اسمه على الديس على السكرين ما انا قادر لا انت الاول بس روح على البرزنتيشن لوحده افتحه الاول وبعدين ادخل اعمل شير هيفتح لك السكرين اعمل له شير طيب ثواني بس خد راحتك باقي لك ثلاث دقائق والوقت الرسمي بتاعك يوصل هذا ابشر ولا يهم دكتور نبيل ايوه ظاهره الحين هذه لا لازم تدخل تفتحها الاول وبعدين تدخل تعمل شير منها ما فتحت اوكي طيب كلمة أه دكتور علي بعد اذنك حضرتك افتح البرزنتيشن من بره زوم من غير زوم خالص من بره اوكي خلاص كده اه كده تمام اعمل فول سكرين بقى فول سكرين شور تمام الله ينور استنى بقى اعمل لك تقديم ثاني عشان دكتور سمير قدمتك وانت مش موجود بس الصوت ليش ما طالع معايا يا ابو محمد علي الصوت عندك انت بس صوت الصوت في الجهاز بتاعك بس انت بس سامعني كويس انا سامعك كويس جدا طيب يلا I will present you. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أستاذ الله مساء الجميع Can we start? I will present you again So last speaker will be Dr. Ali Abdu Nasser Al-Habub Dr. Ali is the consultant pediatric intensivist He is the head of the intensive care unit in King Khalid University Hospital He will give us our last two lectures The first one will be pulmonary hypertension in children The second one will be multiple system inflammatory syndrome. Okay, Dr. Ali, you can start. Welcome and you can start. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa 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 Uh, my first talk will be about pulmonary hypertension in children. And uh, يعني, what does it mean, pulmonary hypertension? It is simply it is high blood pressure of the blood vessels in the lungs. That is a simple thing. Uh, it is a disease characterized by elevated, uh, uh, elevated uh, uh, pulmonary artery pressures, which result in the right ventricular fa failure. And it is very important to know this issue. I know most of the symptom will be from this entity when you know you know the, the the arteries in the in the lungs have their own muscles and these muscles for any for example if there is any increased blood flow or hypoxia or other this muscle get yani, yani enlarged and it is the cause of the pulmonary hypertension it can appear any age from the first day of life till the last day of life uh, and In children, the pulmonary hypertension is most commonly associated with the underlying causes or lung disease, but it may also be adiabatic or familiar, as they said. The elevated pulmonary artery pressure mean will be around this, the, the pulmonary artery pressure above 20, and it should be above the three months of age. Before that, it is much higher. What is the pathophysiology of this entity? Pulmonary hypertension can be due to a primary elevation of pressures in, uh, in the pulmonary artery system. Also increase the blood flow through the... Just for a while, please, I want to move this one. Now. The pulmonary, yes. My Dr. Nabil? Yes, Dr. yes. Nabil? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. So the pulmonary What? hypertension can be due to a primary elevation of pressures in the pulmonary artery system alone, or increase the blood flow through the pulmonary circulation, or elevation of the pressures in the pulmonary vessels. What is the classification of this entity? Either it could be transient, as pulmonary hypertension of the newborn or uh, pulmonary hypertension with the diaphragmatic hernia or pulmonary hypertension with the acute pulmonary disease or pulmonary hypertension with the intracardiac shunt. Other than transient, it could be progressive and this is usually a diabetic entity. Pulmonary hypertension with the, inter uh, with the intracardiac shunt with uh, late repair and pulmonary hypertension with the chronic lung disease. What are the presentation of this entity? Usually it can present with dyspnea and exertion and fatigue, syncope, cyanosis, and it can also present with failure to, to thrive, as well as cough and chest pain and heart failure. What is the explanation of this uh, exhaustion and cough? Because of يعني, يعني, the, the lung congestion and also the heart failure. Symptoms may be more notable if there is super infection, super added infection on this uh, pulmonary hypertension. The physical examinations may be unremarkable. The patient come to you totally normal finding, and you need certain investigating uh, tools to uh, prove it. With the right ventricular dilatation, there might be a left parastemnal heave, and the second heart sound usually will be loud. A patient may have hepatomegaly, ascites, and 
anasarka this is secondary to the heart failure how we can diagnose this uh, problem usually we can start by a simple chest x-ray and it will uh, show us the cardiomyelin due to the enlargement of the right heart side associated with the ventricular hypertrophy right ventricular hypertrophy it might show some pulmonary edema and uh, present with the heart failure the ECG also can help, can tell us about right uh, ventricular hypertrophy and the uh, blood work as BNB or BRU BNB, that is, can also be highly elevated. Echocardiography is the most helpful test and it is practical يعني, way to evaluate the uh, entity because the other one, which is the gold standard or the most yeah, definite diagnosis as we will come to with catheterization, but uh, it's not as practical as ECO. Uh, what ECO will show us, provide the following information, the identification of structure of the cardiac region and estimation of the right ventricular pressure and assessment of the right uh, ventricular systolic function and assessment of valve regurgitation. It will, it will also give us an, <clears throat> sorry, an idea about the gradient in the uh, pulmonary, uh, between the pulmonary artery and the right ventricle. As we said, the cardiac catheterization is the uh, gold standard for the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. However, it is not always necessary during the initial evaluation because it is an invasive procedure that is carries a risk. Cardiac catheterization is sometime deferred until the, initial, uh, the initiation of the targeted pulmonary hypertension therapy under consideration. The indication of the cardiac cath in this entity when the non-invasive testing is inadequate or non-diagnostic, as we mentioned, ECO or ECG. Follow-up of the patient on targeted therapy. This is also sometime you need to repeat cath every two, three years according to the severity, according to the symptom of the patient. In patient with systemic to pulmonary shunt to assess the, uh, the operability, if the patient is operable or not, and usually they do it more frequent. What is the advantage of the uh, cardiac cath? It provides a more accurate measurement of the pulmonary artery pressures. It provides also additional hemodynamic measurement like cardiac output and arterial pressure in addition to the pulmonary cabriotic pressures. It allows also measurement of flow through the shunt. And in some cases, intervention can be performed to close the shunt lesion. It's also allow the vasoreactivity testing, which we can, uh, which we are coming to it soon. This is what's called acute vasoreactivity testing. It involves the administration of short-acting vasodilator followed by measurement of the hemodynamic response. What are the typical vasodilator medication? Usually we are talking about nitric oxide or 100% oxygen or inhaled uh, prostaglandin 12 analog, as well as the uh, IV uh, Viagra or Sildenafil. The definition of the reactivity, how can we say this test positive or negative? If more than 20% decrease in the mean pulmonary artery pressure, the test is positive. This means there is a response to those medications which we are giving. Uh, decreased ratio of systemic to pulmonary vascular resistance also, in addition to no decrease in the cardiac output and unchanged or increased cardiac index. What is the treatment? We have conventional medical therapy. We have treatment of the underlying disorder and we have targeted medical therapy. If we start by the conventional one, usually we're talking about oxygen therapy can be helpful in patient with the arterial uh, desaturation. Diuretics, it can also Diuretics will also decrease the congested lung and also improve the symptoms. The dioxin, the rule is unclear, but still some people, they are using it when there is the right ventricular failure. Anticoagulant may be considered in some cases like in patients with 
low cardiac output, patient with the progressive adiabatic arterial uh, pulmonary hypertension. The, the role of this anticoagulant is so to, to, to relieve some of these clot which uh, form. However, this has not been studied in children and the benefits are not clear. Warfarin is indicated in patients with pulmonary hypertension secondary to thromboembolic disease. However, this is a rare cause of pulmonary hypertension in children. Aspirin is some, sometimes used as alternative for the warfarin. Systemic to pulmonary cardiac shunting lesion, we have to close the defect. This is the treatment. Left heart obstruction lesion, also correction of the obstruction. Hypoxic lung disease, we have to provide supplemental oxygen and uh, ventilatory support. When hypoxic lung disease, usually uh, clear with the, especially with upper airway obstruction, it's persistent for a long time. Gastroesophageal reflex disease, the treatment is acid suppressing the uh, acid. Obstructive sleep apnea, the treatment is supplemental oxygen and adenotensilectomy and ventilatory support at night to prevent further hypoxia. Underlying systemic disease like collagen vascular disease, the treatment is the immune suppressant therapy, either steroid or others. Thromboembolic disease, the treatment is warfarin or other anticoagulant, and acute respiratory infection, the treatment will be antibiotics. What are the treatment for uh, direct uh, uh, targeted pulmonary hypertension? It is generally indicated for patients who have symptoms and function limitation or patient who severe pulmonary hypertension who lack uh, aberrant symptoms, particularly young children in whom it may be difficult to elicit symptoms. The choice for the initial agent is treatment for pulmonary hypertension is based on large part of the result of the AVT, the test which we said which we are using the nitric oxide or oxygen. Calcium channel blockers is it's a treatment in some cases, especially in Fidibine. The side effect is hypotension and bradycardia and flushing. Calcium channel blockers should not be used in patients with the depressed right fun uh, fun uh, function. Non-reactive AVR, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, uh, type 5 inhibitor. This is uh, like cylindrophil or tadalafil. Side effect, everybody knows, flushing, headache, na uh, nasal congestion. Sensor neuro hearing loss and ischemic uh, optic neuropathy have been also reported in cases of this uh, phosphodiesterase stress inhibitor. In extremely uh, preterm, in fact, use should be delayed until the retinal vasculature is already established. Same and non reactive AVR, brustacycline, uh, eborostinolol is one of the yani, re recent treatment and it is very effective. Side effect is also flashing, headache, nausea, and diarrhea. Yo discomfort, rash, hypotension. Potential risk of bleeding in children receiving concomitant drugs such as anticoagulant or platelet inhibitors. In case of right to left shunt procedures, uh, creation of an arterial septal opening or pulmonary artery to aortic communication to permit a right to left shunting. This is just to decrease the flow to the right side, and this, and uh, by this by this way, it will decrease the pulmonary blood uh, blood pressure and decrease pulmonary hypertension. Mechanical support, the mechanical ventilation. The ex, uh, either on mechanical ventilator on high, giving high amount uh, of, of oxygen, uh, I mean BO, or mechanical support through extracarboreal mem membrane oxygenation, which is ECMO. Lung transplantation is the last uh, uh, choice, but it's not practical as other, uh, although in yani some uh, cases or, or many cases actually done here in our country, especially in King Faisal. In case of acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis, it is potentially fatal, 
complicated by pulmonary hypertension. Uh, it is um, manifested by rapid rise in the pulmonary vascular resistance, leading to acute right heart failure and inadequate cardiac output. It can be uh, triggered by multiple causes, including surgery, anesthesia, and others. Uh, when, in, when the intensivist or neonatologist have this entity in his unit, I don't think he's going to have a good sleep because most of the time the oxygenation up and down reached to 50s, reached to a detectable smiling because he got a lot of ca these cases. Yes. What are the general, uh, the general principle for management of the pulmonary hypertension? Uh, Provide pulse for cardiac arrest situation with the pulmonary hypertension, administer supplemental oxygen, avoid hypercarbia, you know, at least lead to acidosis. The acidosis mo cause more vasoconstriction and correct metabolic acidosis. And actually, one of the modalities is to give as much sodium bicarb if possible to shift the patient for, to the metabolic alkalosis. Avoid hypovolemia and administer inhaled nitric oxide, which is really very effective, especially when the patient already on high frequency and provide also a good sedation and analgesia in addition to support cardiac output and mechanical ventilation support. Follow up of children with a clinically significant pulmonary hypertension typically care occur even six months and include an interval history and physical examination. Echocardiogram, as you said, can be repeated either six monthly or every one year according to the severity and the important aspect of the long-term in healthcare maintenance in children. Include routine immunization, monitoring, and others. Pulmonary hypertension is a disease characterized by elevated. Uh, that's okay. That's I think we finish. Infant and children uh, with pulmonary hypertension should be many uh, in a center with the experience and have also facilities for cardiac cath and uh, for. Uh, ECMO. The choice of targeted therapy is based on the severity and the patient with the safer pulmonary hypertension is refractory to the therapy have a high risk of mortality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for your uh, nice presentation in this uh, very difficult uh, subject. Uh, I think you took it more practically, and this is good for us. And uh, as you told, this case will be a nightmare for any intensivist. Uh, I don't have any uh, questions right now, so we can proceed to the second uh, presentation, Dr. Ali. You want to ask? Uh, just wait, Dr. Asamir, I want to ask something. One minute. We'll go to the same dilemma, one minute, new share. There is one out. In, in one of the slides, ASA was mentioned as uh, the treatment option, but... Uh, you can read the question? هو اعتقد يا دكتور علي انت محتاج تعلي الصوت في الكمبيوتر بتاعك الصوت بتاعك صوت الكمبيوتر هتلاقيه واطي عليه بس شويه هتسمعنا طيب ثواني بس خلنا ادخل على Is it clear now, Muhammad? Which presentation? No, you are still in the same, the old one. You can close the old one and open the new. Yes, this is a new one. But still we have uh, someone want to ask about the first presentation, Dr. Ali. Questions? Yes. Not yet clear, Abu Muhammad? Now is okay. Now the presentation is okay. But someone want to ask about the, the first presentation. Can you read there 
زر الزر زر الزر صراحه صوت ما في عندي ابدا يا علي الصوت اللي عندك يا دكتور علي الصوت بتاع الكمبيوتر هو اللي واطي الصوت نفسه الصوت علي الصوت مش ال مش المايك المايك كويس طيب ممكن اخلي اخر السؤال بس نبدا بهذه خلاص تمام خليه أف... خليه بعد البرزنتيشن اوكي يلا يو كان بروسيد تو ذا نيكست برزنتيشن جو اهيد اوكي ناو اوكي طيب طيب بيدياتريك مالتي سيستم انفلاماتري ديزيز ذيس از ان انتيتي ويتش ديفلوب اكشولي افتر ذا Uh, occurrence of the COVID-19. Actually, the first few cases which I'm going to, you, you are going to see, appear almost four to five months after the first case of COVID was uh, uh, discovered. The objective will be as introduction and definition, diagnosis and differential diagnosis, treatment and mechanism, as well as complication and prognosis. It is a new The introduction for this one is an unusual childhood illness appear months behind the COVID-19. It increased, this COVID-19 increased the risk of Kawasaki disease in almost 30 times. There was a prolonged course of illnesses and the observation all over the world. As we can see in the first uh, four months after COVID in the coming, and you see in Australia, they discover few cases in France and in Canada. Also, the same thing in Portugal, actually, in Britain, I think they discovered 14 cases immediately in the fourth month after the uh, COVID. Okay. What is the definition of the uh, MIS-C? Is that children or adolescents between 0 to 19 years, some of them, some other definition said up, yani below 21 years. Uh, the condition, it should be, there should be a fever which is there for more than three days and actually it should be above 38 38 to 38.5 and two of the following either rash bilateral non-brilliant conjunctivitis and you can see most of these will be like those presentation of uh, Kawasaki hypotension and shock or shock and the features of the myocardial sorry features of my myocardial uh, dysfunction like pericarditis, valvulitis, and uh, coronary abnormalities. Evidence of the coagulopathy and acute gastrointestinal problem like diarrhea, vomiting, or elevated markers like ESR, selective protein, and brucalcitonin. In addition, no other obvious differential diagnosis for this one, and presence of infection by COVID two or three months before. What is the CDC definition with the Center of Disease Control? They define the case as a multi-inflammatory syndrome, an individual below 21 years presenting with fever, laboratory evidence of inflammation and evidence of clinically severe illnesses. There should be no other alternative disease and there should be a positive current or recent SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus causing the COVID-19. And also to make more confusion, this yani, the same condition is called also BIMC, or pediatric inflammatory multisystem disease, either temporary or transient, according to either in Europe or in the state. This is the way they are defining the entity. The patient should have fever for 38 plus, more three to four days, and any one of the symptoms, the GI symptom, as you said, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, skin rashes, conjunctivitis, oral uh, change, and cough. Plus, one of these inflammatory issues, either CRB, brucalcitonin, ferritin, or brew BNB. And when you, any one of this, either Kawasaki, uh, one of the Kawasaki presentation, like uh, uh, and incomplete Kawasaki symptom, like uh, uh, anemia and platelet more than 450 or cardiogenic and distributive shock and evidence of single or multi-organ. Any of these presence of them as combination or 
a few of them can give you the, the diagnosis. What is the history of the entity? Fever for three days, GIT manifestation, as we say, diarrhea, abdominal pain, vomiting, and respiratory symptoms, shortness of breath and cough, and also extra finding. In addition to alter mental status, physical examination, the child looks usually sick, and there is a sign of shock, hypotension, and a change in the heart rate. Prolonged capillary refill, in addition to tachypnea and metal skin. Physical finding may not appear initially, which is, yeah, sometimes we do discharge the patient from the emergency room, and they do come, they do, they do come within 12 to 24 hours with the worsening condition. Investigation, no specific di uh, diagnostic test. All the investigation, general uh, small in investigation. And diagnosed based on the clinical and laboratory evidence. And general tests like CBC, chemistry, inflammatory markers, cytokinase, and coagulation studies, ferritin, and uh, troponin. Actually, ferritin, yeah, and it's, it's usually very high in the case of uh, missing. Specific test, of course, we should have either antibodies or antigen for COVID-19. Uh, this to, to diagnose the missing. ECG can also show some finding and serial monitoring of the laboratory markers is needed. Imaging studies like chest X-ray, which show the infiltration of the lung, in addition to ECO, which is very essential if you, are, you want to talk about the myocardial involvement or sometimes they can have also a coronary aneurysm as the same presentation of Kawasaki or atypical Kawasaki. What are the differential for this entity? As we said, Kawasaki, scarlet, toxic shock syndrome, septic shock, and measles. Other differential, HLH, macrophage activation, LMAS, uh, and uh, hemorrhagic shock as well as SLE and other uh, type of vasculitis. What is the treatment for this entity? Is it uh, refers shock and refers organ dysfunction. Refers of shock, as everybody knows, the golden hour of treatment, and also yani, refers of the organ dysfunction, especially if there is lung, bad lung involvement, you need to intubate. If there is renal uh, deterioration or and yani severe renal impairment, you need to start CRRT or other form of dialysis. We have to also to prevent further injury and complication like coronary aneurysm. What's the admission criteria? Surely when the patient came to you who need, need hospitalization, yani better to admit this patient to a hospital with the ICU surface. Then ultimately they need to go to the ICU. Regardless of whether the patient uh, meets the uh, MISSI criteria or not, or underlying he sh uh, uh, patient should be admitted for observation. We have to consider admission in these following areas also, if there is abnormal vital signs, if there is any respiratory distress, if there is any neurological deficit, and hepatic or renal dysfunction, and marked elevation of the inflammatory markers. What is the treatment? Uh, actually, this yani, the entity is yani, excellent prognosis if you catch it early and we give the appropriate management, which in the form of yani, excellent support, either, uh, sorry, supportive care as intubation, giving oxygen, giving the fluid, treatment of shock, anti-inflammatory agent, and we are anti-inflammatory, we are talking about uh, either uh, steroid, like in initially the standard uh, management is the IVIG. And, and when it's, if it is giving earlier, the outcome will be much better. Immune modulator uh, therapies like anaka, anakara and also can be given in these cases. People think about antiviral, anti-COVID, but usually this uh, MISSI will come few months later, yani after the, the treatment with the antiviral is not effective and uh, not beneficial. We have to monitor here frequent monitoring of lab with, during the admission and serial ECG monitoring. In addition, consider the cardiac MRI. The timing of the entity which came through yani after three or four months of COVID 
indicate that the virus is not the one causing the uh, insult to the organs, but actually, actually it is supposed to be the immune system of the uh, of the host itself. How to prevent uh, what what are the complications? The development of the coronary aneurysm has been also detected in some case, and as we said, uh, Messi can have same presentation of the uh, Kawasaki, also the same complication. The prognosis of this case is actually excellent. And I'm sure if uh, any of intensivists here, and he can hear us, Dr. Nabil, I think he know this entity. I'm sure he deal with many cases. Myself, yani not less than 10 to 15 cases, we deal with them either in our uh, hospital or in the uh, private. And the outcome, uh, almost 100% recovery, unless it's complicated by yani, severe bacterial infection. Uh, the only non-preventive measure for this one is to prevent the uh, COVID-19, which already done by the uh, uh, vaccination. Some people do ask about the vaccination, both the entity, is it needed? Yes. Uh, usually, they, they can get a benefit of uh, vaccine. I'm talking about COVID vaccine. It uh, should not be immediately during the disease, actually after two to three months. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for uh, your nice presentation. Yes, sure, we dealt with a lot of cases after COVID. Alhamdulillah, uh, they were all saved, and uh, I hope that we will not see anymore, especially when we hear that COVID is coming back. Uh, so back, I want to, to ask, can you hear me, Dr. Ali? Ali? والله بعيد يا ابو محمد بعيد بعيد جدا انا عندي مشكله لما يبدو في المايك تبع اسمه تبع اللابتوب لا الصوت علي الصوت الصوت هو اللي فيه مشكله المايك كويس انا سامعك علي الصوت عشان تسمع هو اللابتوب حق حق ابني انا مش عارف صوته وين هو مش طيب اتفضل اسال السؤال يا ابو محمد خلينا اسمع السؤال الأول كنت بتتكلم عن الأسبرين as a treatment for pulmonary hypertension. نعم. وقلت إن هو there is uh, يعني a risk of race syndrome. نعم. اللي بتسأل بي, بيتقول اللي هو uh, دكتورة مازنة منصور بتقول is there is any particular population when it can be used؟ بتكلم عن الورفرين أبو محمد؟ لا عن الأسبرين. الأسبرين they said only in very limited cases and uh, uh, yeah, it's not the standard treatment هم uh, الورفرين بيستعمل أكثر من الأسبرين So what is the population for this? There is a special population or no? It, 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 if, there, if there is any form of platelet dysfunction or a form of uh, thrombocytopenia it is absolutely contraindicated Okay. طيب السكند كويشن دكتوره هاله يوسف What is the treatment of pulmonary hypertension due to chronic lung disease? Supportive treatment, mainly supportive treatment. We are talking about oxygen, treating, uh, talking about uh, brustocycline sometime if it is available. Uh, if the patient in the hospital were talking about mil milrinone, the same, the same uh, medication which we mentioned in the talk. Okay. Right. Second uh, question for the second presentation. The dose of the IVIG is 2 gram per kilogram? It, yes, 2 gram per kg as in divided in two doses. One in two each do one. Over two days? Or, uh, for, over two days, naam. Over two days, okay. Sahih. So Samira has a question? البروستاسايكل انالوج في التريتمنت اوف بالمونو هايبرتنشن هاف يو ترايد ات يو هاف اكسبيرينس وذ ذس كان ريبيت اجين دكتور نبيل البروستاسايكل انالوج يا ان ذا تريتمنت اوف بالمونو هايبرتنشن 
Do you have a personal experience with this? No. We do no. we do read about it. No, we do not uh, use it in ours. You are not using it, okay. No. Time. Hmm? Ah, time. Uh, about the blow in the beer, Dr. Ali. No. Go in the beer, when we will do, we'll find it sometimes 5,000, 4,000, 3,000. We don't understand exactly what is the significance of the pro in B and for uh, how we will follow up uh, during the treatment. Yeah, normal up to one to two thousand, but uh, we, we I saw some cases reaching to thirty thousand. Improvement and improvement in this number means there is the yani, the, the myocardium is improving. Ah, uh -huh, so it's an, an indicator that the myocardium is improving. Yes. Okay. That Some will be no reach to 30, 30 40,000. And when we reach down to five, 6,000, this is the usual. Yeah? This is the, yeah, the, the normal uh, level. The normal level. So, uh, it has any, any relation with the prognosis? Of course. When you get the very high number, this is indicate the yani, bad myocardial insult. Bad myocardial insult. Okay. Time. Okay, I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for your uh, two nice lectures and sorry to disturb you in your off day. Thank you. With this, we conclude our uh, sixth international symposium. Uh, I want to thank all the organizing committee, all the speakers, and uh, all attendees. And I hope that it was a fruitful uh, webinar and uh, we get benefit uh, from hearing uh, different experiences from uh, other countries, from USA, from Egypt, from KSA. Uh, and I wish that it will uh, be beneficial for all of us and it will benefit all our uh, patients from the, our tiny babies and uh, all the children all over the world. Uh, thank you so much for you all. Uh, and I hope that uh, it was good for you and uh, hoping to see you all next year, inshallah. Thank you and assalamu alaikum.